This is a reading of the first mystery drama by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Portal of Initiation, a Rosicrucian mystery through Rudolf Steiner. This first part is uh, a description of the characters in the play and the synopsis of the play. And for each scene, I will recapitulate the synopsis before reading the, the scene. Characters. In the prelude and interlude, Sophia, Estella, two children. In the mystery, Johannes Tomasius, Maria, Benedictus, Theodosius, whose archetype is revealed during the course of the play as the spirit of love, Romanus, whose archetype is revealed during the course of the play as the spirit of action, Retardus, active only as a spirit, German, whose archetype is revealed during the course of the play as a spirit of the earth brain, Helena, or Helena, whose archetype is revealed during the course of the play as Lucifer, Philea, Astrid, and Luna, friends of Maria, whose archetypes are revealed during the course of the play as the spirits of Maria's soul forces, Professor Capacius, Dr. Strader, Felix Balda, who was revealed as the bearer of the spirit of nature, Felicia Balda, his wife, <clears throat> the other Maria, whose archetype is revealed during the course of the play as the soul of love, Theodora, Asiris, Araman, conceived to be active only as soul, the spirit of the elements, conceived to be active only as spirit, a child, whose archetype is revealed during the course of the play as that of a young soul. Synopsis Prelude Two divergent views of modern life are exchanged between Estella and Sophia. Their dialogue sets the background of the exoteric world from which the events of the mystery drama detach themselves as the expression of an entirely new beginning in our cultural and spiritual life. Scene 1 we witness the meeting of sixteen individualities inspired by a lecture just given by Benedictus in the house of Maria. Their conversation becomes decisive for the inner path of Johannes Tomasius, the young painter. This first meeting contains all the motives which will continue in supersensible pictures and happenings, the doubts and objections of the two scientists, Professor Capacius and Dr. Strader, the awe-inspiring seership of Theodora, Felix and Felicia Balda's mountain solitude, the other Maria's curative forces, Theodosius's warmth of heart, Romanus's down-to-earth practicality, German's wit, Helena's illusionary enthusiasm. The impact of their joys and sorrows is absorbed by Johannes and leads to his first inner experience in the next scene. Scene 2 Johannes's soul reveals itself to him as a landscape of rocks and springs, out of which resound the ancient mystery words, quote, O man, know thou thyself. Unquote. Scene 3. A meditation room. A child receives a word of blessing from Benedictus. Johannes goes through a severe test in his inner development by witnessing a strange occurrence between Benedictus and Maria. As will become more and more apparent in the mystery drama, the spoken word itself takes on a new force. The mantric lines spoken by Benedictus will transform themselves for Johannes into the experiences of scenes four to seven. Scene four. With full awakened consciousness, Johannes enters the imaginative world, on whose very threshold he encounters cosmic beings from above and below. Lucifer and Araman. The elemental world becomes manifest to him. The spirit of the elements has brought the souls of Capacius and Strader up to a sphere from which they can survey the surface of the earth. They appear here in their true nature, Capacius young and Strader old in character. Then the other Maria appears to them, arising from the rocks and transforming their speeches into forces which spread out over the surface of the earth, nourishing its elemental beings. Scene 5 Before the inner eye of Johannes, 
the hidden mystery place of the spirit leaders of humanity is revealed. In a subterranean rock temple, the four hierophants stand, representing the spirit forces of the east, south, west, and north. Felix Balda and the other Maria find their way into the temple because, quote, the time is now at hand, unquote, to open its treasures to mankind, that is, to lift the truth of the temple's existence into the day consciousness of modern man. Scene 6. Felicia enters the elementary world at the request of the spirit of the elements. She tells a fairy tale for the first time in human evolution directly to the elemental beings, stimulating and provoking by it the, quote, earth's brain, unquote, in the character of German. Scene 7. The spirit world. This scene in which Maria converses with the three soul forces has been treated in its cosmic aspect by Rudolf Steiner in his lectures on quote, the secrets of the biblical story of creation, unquote, which followed the first performance of the Portal of Initiation in Munich, August 1910. He refers also to the part which Theodora plays in the spirit world when her seership reveals past events, an early incarnation of Maria as an apostle of Christianity of the Hibernian Mysteries. At the end of the scene, Benedictus speaks again mantric words, which in their essence lead to the Sun Temple. Scene 11. Interlude. Estella tells of a performance which has a similar plot to the mystery drama, with a fundamental difference that it ends where the latter begins. Sophia's words about the creative capacity of the artist and the need of our time to lift it into full consciousness form a kind of prologue to Scene 8. Scene 8. Johannes Tomasius has painted a portrait of Professor Capacius. He has acquired the capacity of conscious penetration into the spirit background of the individuality. Therefore the shock which Strader receives when he realizes the cognitive forces active in art. Scene 9. Johannes's soul is enhanced by the experience of new spiritual impulses in himself. He is able to identify himself with beings and events of his surrounding world, thus widening himself into his environment. Scene 10 Johannes goes through intensive trials and illusions arising from his enthusiasm, which carries him into a luciferic sphere of self-enjoyment and self-reliance. The spirit presence of Benedictus awakens in him cognitive forces revealing to him the seductive powers of Lucifer and Armand. Through this act of cognition, he is able to hear his voice of conscience, re-establishing his inner balance. Scene 11 Just in medieval times, the true mysteries led to the secret of resurrection, so here in the Sun Temple, the deepest secrets of spirit guidance become manifest. The individualities who have begun the path to higher knowledge find their places for the good of humanity within the temple under the guidance of the spirit leaders in wisdom, love, and force of will. They form a spiritual community based on diversity by which the retarding tendencies are overcome. As the inspiration for the play originates in Goethe's tale of the green snake and the beautiful lily, at the end of, quote, conversations of German emigrants, unquote, a comparative list of the characters can be helpful for a deeper insight into the ensemble of the play. Relationships, Benedictus, the Golden King, Johannes, Youth, Maria, Lily, Philea, Astrid, and Luna, Three Maidens of Lily, Theodosius, Silver King, The Other Maria, Green Snake, Romanus, Copper King, Felix Balda, Man with the Lamp, Felicia, Woman with the Basket, Retardus, Mixed King, Capacius and Strader, two will-o'-the-wisps. Theodora, hawk. Spirit of elements, fairyman. German, giant. Child, canary. That's the end of the synopsis. Prelude. A room in Sophia's house. The main color is a yellow-red. Sophia, her two children, a boy and a girl, then Estella. The children sing, Sophia accompanying them on the piano. 
The light of the sun is flooding the realms of space. The song of birds resounds through fields of air. The tender plants spring forth from Mother Earth, and human souls rise up with grateful hearts to all the spirits of the world. Sophia, now go to your room, children, and think about the words we have been practicing. Parenthesis, Sophia leads the children to the door. Estella enters. Parenthesis. Estella, I am so happy to see you, Sophia, dear. I hope I'm not intruding. Sophia, not at all, Estella. I'm glad you've come. Parenthesis, she invites Estella to sit down and takes a seat. Parenthesis. Estella, have you good news from your husband? Sophia, quite good. He writes that he's finding the conference of psychologists most interesting, although the way some of the great problems are approached is not very intriguing. With his training in observing people, he's especially aware of one thing, how a kind of spiritual short-sightedness prevents modern psychologists from looking clearly at the essential riddles. Estella, does he intend to speak about something important himself? Sophia, yes, on a subject that seems to him and also to me very important. However, he hardly expects any results from it in view of the biased attitude of his listeners. Estella, Sophia, a special wish brings me here. Couldn't we spend the evening together? Tonight is the performance of The Uprooted. Nothing would please me more than going to the play with you. Sophia, but you've forgotten, dear. Just tonight my society is giving the performance we've been preparing so long. Estella, oh yes, that slipped my mind. I, I should have liked so much to spend the evening with you, my dearest friend. I was rejoicing with all my heart at the thought of having you beside me to look into the real depths of our present-day life. But your world of ideas, which is so alien to me, will destroy even the last remnant of our friendship that has bound us together since our school days. Sophia, you said that so often, and yet again and again you've had to admit that our opinions need not raise any barriers between our feelings for each other. They are still the same as they were in our younger years together. Estella, it's true I have often said so, and yet it constantly makes me bitter to see with every year how your feelings become more and more estranged from everything in life that seems to me worthwhile. Sophia, dear Estella, we could mean much more to each other just by a mutual respect for the differences in our dispositions and the directions they've taken. Estella, cold reasoning often tells me you are right, but oh, something in me rebels against the way you look at life. Sophia, honestly, if you would only admit to yourself that you're really asking me to deny the very core of my nature. Estella, Yes, I'd admit even that, if it were not for one thing. I can well imagine that people who think differently can very well come together with complete sympathy. But actually the direction of your ideas makes you assume a certain superiority. Other people can exchange their views and realize that they do indeed differ in their standpoints, which still are equally justified. Your view, however, claims to be more profound than all the rest, which it looks on simply as products of a lower level of human development. Sophia, you should know from what we have discussed so often that no one who shares my views evaluates a person according to his opinions or his knowledge. Ella, Estella, that sounds very well, but it doesn't rid me of a certain suspicion. I cannot close my eyes to the fact that a view of the world which ascribes to itself unlimited depths must lead to a certain superficiality. Just think of those of your friends who try to impress with the mere pretense of profundity. You are much too dear a friend for me to point out to you those fellow thinkers who swear by your ideas and display their spiritual arrogance in the worst possible way. At the same time, the empty triteness of their minds shows through every word and action. But I won't remind you how callous and unfeeling some of your adherents have been toward their fellow men. At least your greatness of soul could never keep you from the duties our daily life demands of anyone who, in the best sense of the word, can be called good. Sophia, but you can also say that we make every effort not to overestimate an individual merely because he has been allowed to serve our particular view of life. Estella, and now you are going to desert me tonight, just when we can experience true art speaking out about life. This shows me that when it comes to appreciating art, 
even even in you, your worldview produces a definite superficiality, if you'll forgive my saying so. Sophia, where do you find the superficiality in us? Estella, I can say at this special moment that I have now become aware of what genuine art is. I think I understand how it lays hold of the very essence of our lives, and I shudder at the thought of what you prefer, Sophia, to this interest in art that is involved with life itself. Your kind of drama seems to me nothing more than an old-fashioned, didactic, allegorical kind of presentation. Instead of living people, you display puppet-like types, indulging in symbolical events. Sophia, Estella, dear, you don't want to understand that a wealth of life can be found exactly where you see nothing but a web of abstract thoughts, and that there may be people who call your living reality actually poverty-stricken, if it is not measured by the source it springs from. This may sound harsh, but our friendship calls for unvarnished honesty. The Spirit means to you, as to so many others, only the instrument of knowledge. You are conscious only of the thought aspect of Spirit. You have no conception of a living, creative Spirit that forms human beings with the same elemental power as the germinating forces in nature form a seed. Like so many others, what you call unsophisticated and original in art, for instance, to me denies the Spirit. But our attitude toward the world unites fully conscious inner activity with the power of spontaneity. We consciously absorb whatever is unsophisticated and do not rob it of its refreshing richness and originality. Estella, all that is far removed from everything that daily pleads with us for compassion and active concern. Sophia, for you it's enough to have merely reflective thoughts about an individual human being, that he is the result of the conditions around him. You don't want to see that thought can die down into the creative spirit to touch the very source of existence and then emerges to reveal itself as the actual creative germinating force. As little as the forces of the seed have to teach the plant to grow but rather unfold within it as a living entity, so little do our ideas teach. They pour themselves into our being, life enkindling, life bestowing. Estella, you know me long enough to be aware of how I freed myself from a way of living and from thoughts which only follow the dictation of tradition and conventional opinions. I've tried to understand why so many people seem to suffer undeservedly. I've made an effort to get to know the heights and depths of existence. I've also asked the help of science as far as it's been accessible to me and obtained helpful answers. Sophia, And it is to spirit-oriented ideas that I owe everything that gives life its meaning. I owe to them not only courage, but also insight and strength. They give me the hope that I can make of my children human beings who are not merely capable and useful in external life, in the conventional sense, but who are able to sustain an inner tranquility and contentment in themselves. Let me say one more thing. I am quite certain that the dreams you share with so many others can only materialize if men succeed in connecting what they call reality and life with those deeper experiences which you have often termed fantastic, wild imaginings. Estella, to me it is clear that only in art can we experience the true, the higher reality. I seem to feel the pulse beat of our time when I allow such art to challenge me. Sophia, It may seem strange to you when I confess that I find much that to you appears genuine art to be only fruitless criticism of life. For no hunger is stilled, no tears are dried, no source of moral degradation is uncovered when merely the outer appearance of hunger or tear-stained faces or degraded characters are shown on the stage. How this is usually done is unspeakably distant from the real depths of life and the true relationships between living beings. Estella, I understand what you are trying to say, but it only shows too clearly that you prefer to indulge in fantasy rather than face the truths of life. We really go in two different directions in this. So I'll have to be resigned to do without my friend tonight. Parenthesis, she rises, parenthesis. I must go. I think we should still remain the same good friends. Sophia, we should indeed. 
Parenthesis. During the last words, Sophia leads Estella to the door. Parenthesis. Curtain. End of uh, prelude, but there's a footnote. The original extremely long single speeches have been divided and somewhat rearranged by the translators in order to come closer to the conversational style of the modern stage. This has been done only for the prelude. Nothing has been omitted except in the title of the play which Estella describes the disinherited from body and soul, here rendered as the uprooted. A first version of the prelude will be found in the appendix. End of the prelude of the Portal of Initiation Scene 1. This is first the synopsis. We witness the meeting of sixteen individualities inspired by a lecture just given by Benedictus in the house of Maria. Their conversation becomes decisive for the inner path of Johannes Tomasius, the young painter. This first meeting contains all the motives which will continue in supersensible pictures and happenings, the doubts and objections of the two scientists, Professor Capacius and Dr. Strater, the awe-inspiring seership of Theodora, Felix and Felicia Balda's mountain solitude, the other Maria's curative forces, Theodosius's warmth of heart, Romanus's down-to-earth practicality, German's wit, Helena's illusionary enthusiasm. The impact of their joys and sorrows is absorbed by Johannes and leads to his first inner experience in the next scene. The end of the synopsis of Scene 1. <coughs> scene 1. A room rose red in tone. On the right is seen from the audience, the door to a lecture hall. The various persons enter gradually one after another from this hall and linger for a time in the room. Here they discuss some of the things which have been aroused in them by a lecture to which they have just listened. Maria and Johannes enter first, then others join them. The lecture ended some time earlier, and the following is the continuation of conversations already begun in the hall. Maria it grieves me so, my friend, to see you lamed in spirit and in soul, and I must see the loving bond uniting us ten years as fruitless too. Now, this momentous hour, wherein we have been privileged to hear so much that rays forth light into the dark depths of soul, has brought you only pain. With many a word our speaker uttered, I felt within my heart how deeply wounding it must be for you. When formerly I looked into your eyes, they flashed back joy at all they saw, and then your soul held fast in pictures full of beauty, what sunlight and bright air revealing riddles of existence by flooding earthly objects can paint in fleeting moments. Your hand was still unskilled. In glowing, sturdy color you could not yet embody what hovered full of life before your soul. Yet nonetheless there lived in both our hearts the glowing faith that surely a future day would add the art and cunning of the hand to joy of soul, immersed so deeply in the stream of life. What searching spirit forces can reveal about the wondrous nature of the universe would pour forth happiness from your creative work into the hearts of men, or so we thought and hoped, a future blessing in the guise of highest beauty springing from your art. Thus I painted for myself your spirit's goal, but now the forces of your inmost being seem to be extinguished. Creative joy is dead. Your arm that wielded once the brush with youthful strength seems almost paralyzed. Johannes, alas, it is so. I feel all former fire had disappeared out of my soul. With dullness only does my eye behold the glancing beauty that sunlight pours out over everything. My heart stays nearly numb, when changing moods of air are wafting all around me. My hand will not be moved to force into a lasting present what fleetingly from grounds primeval the elemental powers may conjure. Creative joyous urge no more wells up, and darkness shrouds the ways of life for me. Maria, I must deplore so deeply that this should come to you from everything that is for me the highest, the stream of heavenly life, O oh, friend, within this changing play we call existence, a spirit life, eternal, hides itself, and in this life each soul can weave and move. I feel myself in spirit forces that work as th though in ocean depths. I see the life of men as rippling wavelets on the surface of the sea. I feel myself at one with that deep sense of life for which men strive unceasingly, 
and which appears to me as simply our own being's revelation. I have seen how often this was closely joined in someone's inmost core. It raised him to the highest height to which the human heart aspires. Yet, as this lives in me, it shows itself as evil fruit as soon as I allow myself to come in touch with any other human being. This fate of mine reveals itself in all I sought to give to you, who came to me in love, for at my side you wished to tread courageously the path that was to lead to noble work. And what has come of this? All that reveals itself to me as purest life in its own inmost truth has brought your spirit only death. Johannes, yes, that is so. What bears your soul aloft to light-filled heights of heaven hurls me down, when feeling it with you into dark gulfs of death. In friendship's radiant dawn you led me onward to the revelation that pours forth light into those realms of dark which every night unconsciously the human soul must enter, where wanders too the erring human being when death's blackness seems to scoff at all life's truest meaning. Then you affirmed for me the earnest truth of life's return. At that time I was able to imagine that gradually maturing, I'd become a genuine spirit man. It seemed self-evident that keenness of my eye and the creative certainty as artist would only bloom for me out of your fire's noble force. I let it work upon me then, this fire. But, oh, it robbed me of the interplay of my soul forces. Remorselessly it pressed out of my heart all faith I had in world and life. And I've come so far, I even lack the clarity to know if I should doubt or should believe the revelations from the spirit world. I have not even power to love what heralds within you the beauty of the spirit. Maria, for years now I have had to recognize that my own way to live the spirit self becomes its opposite when mingling with the ways of others. Yet I must also see how rich with blessing this power of the spirit is, when it can reach the human soul by other paths. Parenthesis, enter Philea, Astrid, and Luna. Parenthesis. Maria continues. This power speaks in words, and in these words lies strength to lead men's way of thinking to cosmic heights, creating there a mood of joy where dreariness has been. And it can change frivolity of mind to worthy, earnest feeling. It gives to men a sense of certainty. And I... I am completely seized by just this spirit power, but must perceive the pain and desolation it bears with it when pouring forth out of my heart into the hearts of others. Philea. It was as if a symphony, parenthesis, enter Professor Capaci and, and Dr. Strada, parenthesis. Uh, let me read that whole, her whole thing without that description. It was as if a symphony of feelings and opinions had sounded in the circle, uniting us just now. Harmonious tones were there, but also many a harsher dissonance. Maria When many people join in conversation, their words present themselves before the soul as if among them stood mysteriously the archetype of man. It shows itself diversified in many souls, just as pure light, the one, reveals itself within the rainbow's arch in many colored hues. Capacius So, one has now in many years of earnest search explored the changing character of different epochs, examined, too, what was alive in those great spirits who set before men's souls the goals of life and wished to bring to light the groundwork of reality. One could believe to have enkindled the lofty powers of thought in his own soul, and stirred up many questions about destiny. One could assume he felt the firm support of judgment in the mind whenever new experience pressed questions on the soul. But now, the so-called firm support begins to sway beneath me, when, amazed, I hear today, as I have heard before, the kind of thought that's furthered here. And it will break completely under me when I consider how far-reaching its consequences are in life. Quite frequently it has been my concern to bring what I have gleaned from mysteries of the past into such words that listening hearts might be both held and moved. 
and I was glad if I could really warm the smallest corner of my hearer's inner being. Indeed, I seem to have achieved some good. Of failure I cannot complain. But all this work of mine bears out the view which men of action love to emphasize, that thoughts are only shadows, nothing more nor less, within the realm of life's reality. They can indeed enkindle creative forces for our life. To shape them does not lie within power, thought's power. So I have long resigned myself to these few modest words. Where only thought's pale shadows work, all life is paralyzed, and all that goes with life. More potent than the wisest words, enriched with art, will prove in life to be the gifts of nature, the talents and also destiny itself. Tradition, like a mountain weight and mindless prejudice, will always crush the power of the best of words. Yet what is here revealed gives much for men like me to think about. Such an effect is easy to explain, where fervor of cult frenzy pouring over souls makes fools of men. But nothing of this kind is present here. Alone, through reason, is the soul approached. And yet you can create with words true strength for living and touch the deepest in the heart. Besides, this curious something can even penetrate the sphere of will, although to those like me who follow older paths, this something must appear as only shadowy thought. I am quite unequipped to disavow such things. I simply cannot let them work on me. So strangely does this all begin to speak yet not as if it were for me to ward off such experience. It almost seems as if this something could not within itself endure me as I am. Strater, I do agree quite fully with those last words of yours, and I would emphasize more strongly even that all effects upon the soul which we observe arising from ideas cannot in any sense decide their value in the realm of knowledge. The question whether it is truth or error that's living in our thinking must face the single verdict of pure reason. And nobody can seriously deny that what here offers answers to solve life's greatest mysteries in words of only seeming clarity is quite unfit for such a scrutiny. It speaks alluringly to human minds and only tempts the credulous human heart claims to open doors into those realms before which, modest and perplexed with stern deliberation, science stands. Those truly faithful to this science ought to acknowledge that no one can know from whence are gushing the sources of our thought or where life's first foundations lie. Though this admission will be hard for him who all too eagerly would know what lies beyond all knowledge, Yet every glance imposes on the thinker's mind most forcefully the limits of this knowledge, should he be looking at the world outside or turning his attention inward. If we deny our reason and what experience has proved, our steps will sink in nothingness. And who can fail to see how little our modern forms of thought will seriously accommodate what here is claimed as novel revelation? Not much indeed is needed to show how utterly this revelation lacks what gives to thought its firm support and lends the sense of certainty. It may well warm the heart, this strange new revelation. The thinker sees in it mere wishful dreams. Philea Such words will always come from knowledge that has been achieved through dry, prosaic reason. But this is not enough to satisfy the soul that needs to find belief in its own being. It will forever listen to the words which speak to it of spirit and strive to understand what formerly it dimly sensed. To speak of the unknowable may well allure the thinker, but never human hearts. Strader I realize how much there lies in that objection. It's aimed at simple reasoners who only spin out threads of thought and ask what will result from this or that, on which they have already formed opinions. It can't, however, be applied to me. No outer cause has made me devote myself to thought. As child I lived within a pious circle, beholding rites that overwhelmed my senses with pictures of the heavenly realms so skillfully displayed to comfort simple folk. 
and in my boyish soul I felt at times pure bliss when I looked up in rapture toward highest worlds of spirit. To pray was then my heart's necessity. I had my schooling in a cloister, and so my teachers were the monks. The greatest longing in myself was to become a monk. This was my parents' warmest wish as well. Just as I was to be ordained a priest, a stroke of fate removed me from the cloister, and for this accident I must be grateful, for long since had my soul been robbed of its untroubled peace until chance rescued it. I had been meeting many things that had no place within a cloister, I came on natural science in some books that were forbidden me and learned from them of modern research. Adjusting was laborious. I had to search out many paths. So what I found as truth was certainly not won by clever thought alone. In many heated battles I have torn from out my spirit what brought me peace and blessing as a child. I understand the heart with longings for the heights. But for myself, because I recognized that what all spiritual teaching brought was dream, I had to find the solid ground that only facts and science can impart. Luna We each must understand in our own way the meaning and the goals of life. I surely lack ability to prove through modern science what I receive as spiritual teaching here. However, I feel clearly in my heart that but for it my soul would surely die, just as my limbs would die deprived of blood. Dear Dr. Strader, you have much to say opposing us, and what you have described about your inner struggles lends weight to all your words, with even those who cannot follow all you say. But I must often ask myself why it should be that common sense can find the words of spirit so plain and natural and takes them warmly to itself, but feels a shivering of cold when it seeks nourishment of soul in words like those you have just spoken. Theodora, who has entered earlier. Although I feel at home here in this circle, the words which I must hear seem very strange to me. Capacious. And why this strangeness? Theodora, I cannot speak of it myself. Maria, you explain. Exit Theodora. Maria. Our friend has many times described a strange experience that befell her. She felt one day as though transformed, and nowhere could she find an understanding. All felt estranged by her peculiar nature until she found our circle here. Not that we claim to understand what is unique in her, but through our kind of thinking we become quite willing to accept unusual things. We value every sort of human being here. In our friend's life had come a certain moment when everything that had to do with her own life appeared to her to vanish. The past was all as if extinguished in her soul. And since this transformation first took place, this state of mind repeatedly returns. It lasts but a brief time, and otherwise she is like other people. But when she falls into this state, she lacks almost completely the gift of memory. The power also of her sight is gone. What lies around her she can feel, she does not see it. Her eyes begin to shine with a peculiar light, and pictures then appear to her which first were dreamlike, but now they are so clear that only as the prophecy of times to come they can be understood. This we have often seen. Capacious that is exactly what pleases me, so little in this circle, that superstition is mixed up with logic and with reason. It, is always, it has been always so for those who take such paths. Maria, if you can still say this, you do not know how we regard these things. Strader, as for myself, I must acknowledge to hear about such actual revelations is preferable to all these doubtful spirit teachings. But though I lack the answer to the riddle of such dreams, I see them nonetheless as facts. I take it there would be no chance for us to be a witness to this strange state of mind. Maria, perhaps, for here she comes again. It almost seems as if this wonder wants to show itself. Theodora, I am impelled to speak. Before my spirit stands a form in shining light, and from it words sound forth to me. I feel myself in future times, and human beings, I perceive, who are not yet alive, 
They also see the form. They also hear the words, and thus they sound. You have lived long in faith. You have been comforted by hope. So now be comforted with sight. Receive new life through me. I lived once in the souls who sought me in themselves, through words my messengers proclaimed, and through the strength of their devotion. You have beheld in the senses light, have had to put your faith in spirit realms. Now you have won a drop of spirit vision. Oh, feel it deeply in your souls. A human being emerges from the radiant light. It speaks to me. You shall proclaim to all who have the will to hear that you have seen what men shall soon experience, the Christ once lived upon the earth. And from this life it follows that he encompasses as soul men's growth on earth. He is united with the spiritual part of earth. But human beings could not yet behold him as he reveals himself in such a form of being, because they lacked the eyes of spirit, which later shall be theirs. But now the time draws near, when with new power of sight the men on earth shall be endowed, what once the senses could behold, when Christ lived on the earth, will be perceived by souls of men, when soon the time shall be fulfilled. Exit Theodora. Maria. It is the first time that she has come before so many people. She only has been moved before when two or three were present. Capacius. It seems indeed most strange that she should feel impelled as though commanded or required to make this revelation. Maria, that may seem so, and yet we know quite well her nature. If at this moment it was her wish to send her inner voice into your souls, the only reason must have been that the same voice's source wished thus to speak to you. Capacius, it's come to our attention that of this future gift of which she spoke, half dreaming, much mention has been made quite recently by him who is the one we are told inspiring all this circle. Is it not possible the content of her words could spring from him, and that the manner only will be from her? Maria, were this in truth the case, we would not give it weight. The fact remains, however, after careful proof, until she came into our circle, our friend knew nothing of our leader's teaching, and none of us had heard of her before. Capacius, we have to do then simply with a fact such as, cons as occurs at times, conflicting with all the laws of nature, and which we must regard as illness. To judge life's riddles clearly can healthy thought alone accomplish, and what springs forth from wide-awake mentality. Strater, and yet we have a fact before us. It certainly must be important what was just said to us. We might be forced, if we discard all other theories, to take transference of ideas through psychic power in earnest. Ostrid, oh, and if you could only step on to the ground your thought so anxiously avoids, the false belief that lets the revelations of such nature seem peculiar, strange, or even ill, would surely melt away as snow and sunlight. It is significant, but is not strange. For small appears to me this wonder when I behold the thousand wonders that every day surround me. Capacius, it is indeed one thing to recognize what's everywhere revealed, but quite another what is shown us here. Strater, to speak of spirit is only needed when things are placed before us, which do not lie within the scope laid down with such precision by natural science. Ostrid, the gleaming rays of sunlight that glisten in the morning dew, Felix Baldi enters, the spring that gushes from the rocks, the thunder rolling in the clouds, they speak to us a spirit language. I've sought to understand it. The might and meaning of this speech is only faintly mirrored in your scientific research. I felt my soul rejoice when such speech made its way into my heart as human word and spirit science alone can grant to me. Felix Balder, that was a right good word. Maria, I must express to you how much my heart rejoices to see for the first time among us here, Felicia Baldi, Baldi enters, a man I've heard so much about, 
It stimulates the wish to see him now more often here. Felix Balder. I'm unaccustomed to mingle with so many people, and not just unaccustomed. Felicia Balder. Balder. Ah, yes, it is the way with him. It keeps us quite in loneliness. Year in, year out, we hear scarce more than what we speak ourselves, and were it not for this good man, she indicates Capacius, who sometimes comes to our cottage, we'd hardly know that other people were alive. And if the man who spoke now yonder in the hall with his good and noble words has stirred us all so deeply, were not to meet my Felix going about his work, you would know nothing about us long-lost people. Maria, so the professor often visits you. Capacius, assuredly, and I must truly say I owe to this good lady my deepest gratitude. She gives me of her gifts so richly as no one else can do. Maria, and of what nature are her gifts? Capacius, I must allude, if I am to tell about it, to something which in truth seems far more wonderful to me than much that I have heard of here, because it speaks more to my heart. I scarcely should be able to, in another place, to bring the words across my lips, which here I find so easy. I feel my soul at times as though entirely empty and exhausted. It is as if the very fountainhead of knowledge had run dry within me as if I could not find one word that seems worthwhile to speak or to be heard. And when I feel such barrenness of spirit, then I escape and go where these good people have their refreshing, quiet solitude. And there Felicia tells me many a tale, and pictures fabulous, of beings dwelling in the land of dreams and in the realm of magic fairy tales who live a motley life. The tone in which she tells of them recalls the bards of ancient times. I do not ask the sources of her words. But this one thing I clearly know, that new life wells and flows into my soul, dispelling its paralysis. Maria, that such great things are said about Felicia's art, this blends harmoniously in every way with all that Benedictus said about the hidden fount of wisdom in his friend. Felix Balda, as he's speaking, Benedictus appears in the doorway. The one who spoke just now, as if his spirit dwelt in cosmic spaces and eternities, has truly little reason to say much about a simple man like me. Benedictus, my friend, you are mistaken. Of untold value is for me each word of yours. Felix Balda, it was but meddling, the wish to chat, when you at times gave me the honor of walking at your side along our mountain paths. I only dared to speak because you hid how much you know yourself. But now our time is up, and we must go. We have a right long way to reach our quiet home. Felicia Balder. It was a real refreshment to be for once among some people. It will not happen soon again. There is no other life will do for Felix but his mountains. Exit Felix and Felicia. Benedictus. Felicia indeed is right. He will not come so soon again. It's taken much to bring him here this time. And yet the reason does not lie with him that no one knows of him. Capacius, I took him only for some odd stick and found him talkative the many times I spent with him, but his eccentric speech remains obscure to me, wherewith he brings to light the things he claims to know. He speaks of sun-born beings that dwell within the stones, of moon-dark demons who constantly disturb their work, about the sense of number and the plants. A listener will not for long find any meaning whatsoever in his words. Benedictus. But one can also feel as if strong powers of nature sought within his words to manifest themselves in their own being's truth. Exit Benedictus. Strater. Already I can feel that painful days are coming in my life. For since the time when in my cloister's loneliness I made my first acquaintance with that knowledge which struck relentlessly my deepest soul, has nothing moved me more than the encounter with this seeress. Capacius, what should disturb you here so greatly I cannot see. I am afraid, dear friend, that if you lose your certainty of mind in this, you soon will find the gloom of doubt descending upon everything around you. Strader, the fear of just this doubt torments me frequently. From my experience I have no knowledge otherwise about this gift of seership. 
But oftentimes, when unsolved riddles torture me, there rises ghost-like to my spirit vision a frightful dream-born being out of spirit darkness. It lies upon my soul like lead and terrifying clutches at my heart. It speaks through me. You must compel me with your stunted weapons of dull thought, or you are nothing but a fleeting phantom of your own delusion. Theodosius, who has entered earlier, this is the fate of those who only can approach the world through thinking. The Spirit's voice, however, dwells within us. We have no power to penetrate the veil spread out before the senses, and thought can bring us knowledge merely of the things that disappear in course of time. The spirit, the eternal, is only found within the inner depths of man. Strader, the fruit of pious faith is able to bring peace to souls who can, sufficient in themselves, seek out such ways. But strength of real knowledge will never thrive upon this path. Theodosius, yet there are no other ways to quicken in the hearts of men true knowledge of the spirit, though pride can tempt one to distort the Im- to images of fantasy, the genuine feelings of the soul, into Romanus and German and Helena. And it will paint alluring visions where only faith should be in simple beauty. Of everything said here in such an animated way as knowledge brought from higher worlds, one thing alone has value for the honest heart and mind, that only in the spirit world itself the soul can feel at home. The other Maria who has entered with the Theodosius What is contained within such words may satisfy a man as long as he feels moved to merely speak of things. But in the midst of life, with all its striving, its search for happiness, its misery, a different food is needed to hand to human souls. An inner urge has guided me to dedicate the rest of my whole life to those whose destiny has brought them suffering and need. And it was oftener my task to ease the pain within their souls than suffering of body. On many paths I felt indeed the weakness of my will, and constantly I had to win fresh strength from the abundance flowing here out of the fountain of the Spirit, the warm and magic power of words that here I listen to streams down into my hands and flows through them like balsam when they touch the sorrow-laden, and it transforms itself upon my lips to strengthening words which carry comfort to pain-racked hearts. I do not ask the source of these words' power. I look upon their truth when, full of life, they give me life. So every day I see more clearly that they derive their strength, not from my will in all its weakness, but daily they create myself for me anew. Capacius. But surely there are many who, though they lack this revelation, do untold good. Maria. Indeed, such people can be found in many places. But it is something else our friend would like to say. And when you learn about her life, you will speak differently. When unused forces can flourish in the bloom of youth, love springs abundantly out of the heart's good soil. Our friend, however, had exhausted her life's strong forces through excessive work, and all her courage was taken from her by bitter weight of destiny. She sacrificed her strength in bringing up her children carefully. Her courage ebbed when early death took her beloved husband from her. In such a state, fate seemed to have in store a weary remnant only of her life. But powers of destiny then brought her into our circle, and the teaching of the Spirit, wherein her own life forces blossomed a second time. With her new aims in life, fresh courage streamed into her heart. In her the Spirit has in truth, from the decaying seed, created the new-born man, And if, with such creative forces, the Spirit shows it can be fruitful, this seems to justify the way the Spirit is revealed. And now, let this be said without impertinence, that is, if pride does not lie hidden in these words, if in the heart there live high moral purposes, if we are sure our teaching is not our own achievement, that only Spirit explains itself within us, with this in mind it can be said that in in your way of thought, There weave dim shadows only of the real sources of man's being. The spirit which ensouls us unites itself in inward warmth with everything that in the depths of life spins human destiny. 
Throughout the years since I have been allowed to serve this active work, I have met with far more wounded hearts and far more longing souls than many would imagine. I prize the lofty flight of your ideas and your proud certainty of knowledge. I like to think that at your feet a throng of eager hearers sit, and that for many souls there flows from out your work uplifting clarity of thought. And yet it seems to me such certainty dwells in this thinking only as long as it remains apart within itself. The kind of thought I follow sends into deep realities the fruitage of its words, because in deep realities it will implant its roots. Far distant from your thinking lies the script upon the spirit heavens, with forceful symbols heralding the new-grown shoot upon the tree of man. Though clear and sure may seem your thinking that lives on in the old way, it can supply the tree's dry bark, but does not reach into the living power of its heart. Romanus I cannot find the bridge that leads across from mere ideas to actual deeds. Capacious. One undervalues here the power of ideas, but on the other hand, you fail to grasp the course of real life. Indeed, it is ideas that are the seeds of every human act. Romanus. If this good person has achieved so much, the impulse lies in her warm heart. When work is done, Men surely need refreshment and renewal from ideas, but only training of the will, combined with skill and strength and all the genuine work of life, will further human progress. When whirr of wheels is humming in my ears, and when contented human hands are laboring at machines, it's then I feel the powers of life at work. German I've often lightly said in passing that I am fond of joking and only find in it some spirit that for my brain it nonetheless remains a pleasant means to occupy the time between the hours of work and those of pleasure. But this remark has now become to me distasteful. An unseen power has laid hold of me, and I have learned to feel what is much stronger in our human nature than the thin house of cards our wit sets up. Capacious. And nowhere else but here have you been able to find such spiritual power? German. The life which I have led has brought me varied spirit values. I had no wish to pick their fruits. And yet this kind of thought has drawn me to myself, despite how little I myself have done. Capacious. We have enjoyed enriching hours here, and must be grateful to the hostess of this house. Everyone except Maria and Johannes go out. Johannes. Stay here a little longer. I am afraid. Oh, so afraid. Maria, what is it? Tell me. Johannes, first came our leader's words, and then what all these people said. Now I feel shattered to the core. Maria, how could these words affect you so intensely? Johannes, each word became for me at every moment a frightful sign of my own nothingness. Maria, was indeed significant to hear poured out in a short time so much about life's battles and human character and all this interplay of words. And yet it is the nature of the life we lead to wake the human spirit to expression. What otherwise is brought to light in course of time is here revealed within an hour or two. Johannes, a mirrored image of the whole of life, that showed me clearly to myself. What is revealed to us out of the Spirit has led me to perceive how many men who think themselves a whole in fact bear in themselves one single facet only. In order to unite within myself all these divergent sides, I started boldly on the path taught here, and it has made of me a nothing. What all these people lack I know quite well. I also know they stand in life and I in empty nothingness. Whole lifetimes were summed up in brief and weighty speeches, and my life too, as picture, rose within me. The days of childhood first were painted there with happy wealth of life. My youth was painted there with the proud hopes awakened in my parents' hearts by their sons' talents. The dreams of mastering an art, which were my very life in those glad days. 
They all rose warningly from spirit depths. And those dreams rose as well, wherein you saw me transmuting into form and color what lives for you in spirit. Then flames I saw leap forth, that turned the youthful artist's dreams and hopes to ashen nothingness. Out of this barren void another picture formed itself. It was a gentle human being who once had linked her destiny with mine in faithful love. She wished to hold me years ago when I was called to go home to my mother's funeral. I wrenched myself away, for mighty was the force that drew me to your circle and to the goals put forward here. No sense of guilt remained in me from that past time when I destroyed a bond which for the other had meant life itself. And when the message came to me that her life slowly ebbed away and finally succumbed, it never touched me till today. Just now our leader in that room expressed with earnest words how we may injure, even ruin, if our own striving is not right, the destiny of those bound to us in love. Oh, awful sounded back to me those words, these words out of the picture, resounding forth from every side like an excruciating echo, You are her murderer. And thus the forceful, earnest speech we heard has been the motive for the others to look into themselves. In me, however, it has quickened the consciousness of deepest guilt. Through it I can perceive how wrongly I have striven. Maria, in this grave moment, O oh my friend, you enter gloomy realms, and there is no one can help you, only he in whom we put our trust. Helena returns. Maria is called away. Helena, I feel compelled to stay a little while with you. Your eyes have looked unhappy now for weeks. How is it that the glorious shining light can bring such gloom into your soul when you with all your strength are striving for the truth? Johannes, and has this light brought only joy to you? Helena, not simply joy, as I knew formerly, but joy that springs up, bursting into life within the words through which the Spirit proclaims itself. Johannes, and yet I say to you what works creatively can also crush. Helena, an error must be creeping then with craftiness into your soul, if this is possible, for if anxiety, instead of blissful freedom and sorrowful despair, instead of joy of spirit, flow from the sources of the truth for you, then seek out all the faults that block your way. How often have we learned that health is the true fruitage of our teaching, and from it living forces bloom? How should it cause the opposite in you? I see these fruits in many people who gather trustingly around me here. Old ways of life become strange, and still stranger to the soul. New wellsprings open for the heart, which then renews itself. To see into the depths of being does not create desires which can torment. Exit Helena. Johannes. It took me many years to understand that what our senses show is an illusion, unless the knowledge of the Spirit can join with it as true companion. But that the words of highest wisdom are only an illusion in the soul in you, a single moment has revealed. Curtain. End of scene one of the Portal of Initiation. This is a reading of The Soul's Probation, the first of the four mystery dramas by Rudolf Steiner. This is scene two, and the synopsis is, Johannes' soul reveals itself to him as a landscape of rocks and springs, out of which resound the ancient mystery words, O man, know thou thyself. Scene two, a place in the open, rocks and springs. The whole surroundings are to be thought of as within the soul of Johannes Tomasius. What follows is the content of his meditation. From the springs and rocks resounds, O man, know thou thyself. Johannes, for many years these words of weighty meaning I have heard, they sound to me from air and water, they echo up from depths of earth. And just as in the acorn secretly the structure of the mighty oak is pressed, within the power of these words there is contained all that my thought can comprehend about the nature of the elements, of souls as well as spirits, 
of time and of eternity. The world and my own nature are living in the words, O man, know thou thyself. From the springs and rocks resounds, O man, know thou thyself. Johannes And now, within me it is becoming terribly alive. Around me darkness weaves, within me blackness yawns. Out of the world of darkness it resounds, out of soul blackness it rings forth. O man, know thou thyself. There sounds from springs and rocks, O man, know thou thyself. Johannes And now it robs me of myself. I change with every hour of the day, I melt into the night. The earth I follow in her cosmic course. I rumble in the thunder, I flash within the lightning, I am. But, oh, I feel already separated from my being. I see my body's shell. It is an alien being outside myself. It is remote from me. There hovers nearer now another body. and With its mouth I have to speak. He brought me bitter sorrow. I gave him all my trust. He left me in my grief alone. He robbed me of the warmth of life and thrust me deep into cold earth. She whom I left, unhappy one. I was now she herself, and I must suffer her despair. Self-knowledge lent me strength to pour myself into another self. O oh, cruel words! Your light is quenched by its own power. O oh, man, know thou thyself. There sounds from springs and rocks. O oh, man, know thou thyself. Johannes, you guide me back again to the spheres of my own being. Yet how do I behold myself? My human form is lost. As raging dragon I must see myself, begot of lust and greed. I clearly sense how an illusion's cloud has hid me, has hid from me till now my own appalling form. The fierceness of my being will devour me, and running like consuming fire through all my veins, I feel those words which hitherto with elemental power revealed to me the truth of suns and earths. They live within my pulse, they beat within my heart, and even in my thought itself I feel those unfamiliar worlds flare up as wild desires. This is the fruitage of the words, O man, know thou thyself. There sounds from springs and rocks, O man, know thou thyself. Johannes, there from the dark abyss what being gloats on me. I feel the chains that hold me fettered fast to you. Prometheus was not chained so fast upon the cliffs of Caucasus as I am chained to you. Who are you, horrifying being? There sounds from springs and rocks. O man, know thou thyself. Johannes. Oh, now I recognize you. It is myself. No knowledge chains to you, pernicious monster. Maria enters, but is not noticed by Johannes for the time being. Myself, pernicious monster, I sought to flee from you. The worlds wherein my folly fled in order to be free from my own self have dazzled and have blinded me, and blind I am once more within the blinded soul. O oh, man, know thou thyself. There sounds from springs and rocks. O oh, man, know thou thyself. Johannes, as if coming to himself, sees Maria. The meditation passes over into inner reality. Maria, you are here. Maria, I've looked for you, my friend. Although I know how dear to you is solitude, now that so many people's views have flooded through your soul. And I know, too, that at this time my presence cannot help my friend. An urge that is obscure is driving me to you this very moment, when words of Benedictus have called up, instead of light, such bitter grief out of your spirit depths. Johannes, how dear to me is solitude! How often have I sought it out to find in it myself whenever joy, pain and joy of men have driven me into the labyrinths of thought. Maria, 
that is past. What Benedictus's words at first drew forth out of my soul and what I then lived through from everything those people said seems little to me now if I compare it to the storm which solitude has brought into my heavy brooding. Oh, this solitude! It drove me into cosmic spaces. It tore me from myself. Within that being to whom I brought such grief, I rose again but as another, and had to bear the pain which I myself had caused. The fierce, dark solitude then gave me back myself, but only to appall me at the abyss of my own being. For me, man's final refuge. For me, my solitude is lost. Maria I must repeat my words to you. No one but Benedictus can now help you. The firm support we lack, we both must have from him. For, no, I also can no longer bear the riddle of my life, unless some sign from him can make the answer clear to me. The lofty wisdom pointing out that only semblance and illusion are spread out over all our life as long as human thinking grasps alone its surface. I've often held it up before my mind. And every time it says, you must be clear that an illusion is shrouding you, though often it may seem the truth, that evil fruit could come from your desire to wake that light in others which lives in you yourself. My soul's best part can see that heavy feelings of oppression in you, my friend, from living at my side, are too a portion of the thorny path that leads you to the light of truth. You must live through each terror to which illusion can give birth before the truth reveals itself to you. Thus speaks your star. Yet through this starry world is also clear to me that we must wander on the spirit paths together. But when I seek these paths, there spreads itself before my gaze dark night. And blacker still becomes this night through much which I must meet as fruit of my own being. We both must look for clarity in that light, which for the eye can vanish, but never be extinguished. Johannes, Maria, are you then aware through what my soul has fought its way? A heavy load indeed has fallen upon you, dear friend, yet foreign to your being is that power which has so wholly shattered me. You can ascend to brightest heights of truth. You can direct your steady gaze at men's confusion. In light, in darkness, you will affirm yourself. But every moment can deprive me of myself. I had to plunge into those people who through their words revealed themselves just now. I followed one into the cloister's loneliness. I heard within the other soul Felicia's tales. I was each one. But for myself I died. I'd have to have the faith that beings spring from nothingness if I should cherish any hope that from the nothingness in me a human being ever could be born. They force me out of fear into the darkness and hunt me through the darkness into fear, these words imbued with wisdom. O man, know thou thyself. From the springs and rocks resounds, O man, know thou thyself. Curtain. The end of scene two. This is scene three of the Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner, the synopsis of scene three. A meditation room. A child receives a word of blessing from Benedictus. Johannes, as will become more and more apparent in the mystery drama, the spoken word itself takes on a new force. The mantric lines spoken by Benedictus will transform themselves for Johannes into the experiences of scenes four to seven. The end of the synopsis. Scene three, a room for meditation. Benedictus, Johannes, Maria, and a child. Maria, I am bringing you the child. He needs a guiding word from you. Benedictus, my child, from now on, you shall come to me each evening to hear the words that then should dwell with you before you enter the soul realm of sleep. Will you do this? Child, I'll do it gladly. Benedictus, this evening fill your heart till sleep enfolds you with strength from these few words. 
the heavenly powers of light are carrying me into the spirit's house. The child is taken out by Maria, who then returns. Maria. And now that this child's destiny shall in the future flow within the shadow of your paternal care, I too may ask your guiding counsel, for I have become his mother through powers of destiny, if not by blood. You showed me how to bring him up from that first day when I discovered him, left by his unknown mother at my door, and all your rules I followed for his guidance worked wonders on my foster child. For every force could come to light that in his body and his soul lay hidden. It soon was clear that your advice sprang from the realm which sheltered this child's soul before it built its body's sheath. We saw it hopefully unfold and shine more brightly each new day. You know how hard it was for me at first to gain the child's affection. He grew up in my care, yet nothing more than habit first joined his soul with mine. He looked to me, perceiving only that I gave him all he needed for the well-being of his body and his soul. Then came the time when in his heart love was enkindled for me, the foster mother. An outer cause brought forth this change. The seeress came into our circle. The child became attached to her and learned, enchanted by the way she spoke, one or the other charming word. Then came a moment when exaltation lay laid hold of our strange friend. Our child could see the glimmering light within her eyes. He felt his young soul shaken to the core and, frightened, rushed to me. From this time on the child has been devoted to me in warmest love. Yet since he now received his care from me, not just through natural impulse, but with awakened feeling, since his young heart stirs warmly whenever he looks lovingly at me, the treasures of your wisdom have lost their fruitfulness and withered now as much that had already ripened in the child. I saw, revealed within his being, what for my friend has proved so terrible. I am evermore a dark enigma to myself. Do not deny my asking this grave question. Why do I ruin friend and child when lovingly I try to do for them the work that spirit guidance lets me perceive within my heart as good? You have shown to me the lofty truth. Illusion's veil is covering the surface of our life. Yet I must have clear knowledge if I must bear this destiny which is so cruel and which, which works such evil. Benedictus There forms itself within this circle a knot out of the threads which karma spins in world becoming. O oh friend, your sorrows are part of such a knot of destiny in which the deeds of gods entwine themselves with human life. When, on the pilgrimage of soul, I had attained that stage which granted me the honor of serving with my counsel in the spirit spheres, there came to me a higher being, which should descend into the realm of earth to take up its abode within a human body. Man's destiny is now demanding this at such a turning point of time. A great step forward in the evolution is only possible when gods unite themselves with man's own lot. For spirit eyes, which should awaken human souls, can only be evolved when first a god has laid the seed within a human being. The task was now assigned to me to find that human being, who might be worthy to accept within his soul the seed force of the god. I had to link a deed of heaven unto a human destiny. My spirit's eye made search. It fell on you. Your course of life had fitted you as mediator for new healing forces. In many lives you had acquired an openness for the nobility alive in human hearts. The precious quality of beauty, the highest claim of virtue, you carried in your gentle soul as spirit heritage. What your eternal ego brought down into this life before birth matured to ripened fruit in your first youthful years. You did not scale too soon the lofty spirit heights. The longing for the spiritual world did not arise in you till you had, grasp, till you had fully grasped the senses' innocent delights. Your soul encountered love and anger, while as yet your thought was far away from all desire for spirit. To drink the joy of nature in her beauty and pick the fruits of art was all you wished to find as riches in your life and you could gaily laugh as only a small child can laugh 
who has as yet no knowledge of life's grey shadow side. You learned to fathom human happiness and mourn men's pain in times when not an inkling had yet dawned of questioning the root of joy and sorrow. The soul who shows such character encounters earthly life as the ripe fruit sprung from many lives. Its childlike nature is its blossom, not its root of being. It was this soul alone that I could choose as mediator for that spirit who should attain to active power within our human world. So comprehend now that your being must change into its opposite when pouring forth from you to other beings. The spirit in you works in everything that can grow ripe in man as fruits for realms eternal, and therefore much it must destroy that only has its place within the realm of time. Its sacrifice in death, however, is seed of immortality. What flourishes for higher life must bloom from death of lower being. Maria, so this is how it stands with me. You give me light, but light that robs me of the power of sight and tears me from myself. Am I then nothing but a spirit's mediator and not my own true being? No more will I endure this form of mine which is a mask and not the truth. Johannes, dear friend, what is it? Your gaze has lost its light. Your body's turned into a pillar. I take your hand and it is cold as death. Benedictus, my son, you've had to meet with many trials, but now you stand before the hardest one. You see her body's covering, and yet before my gaze herself soars into spirit spheres. Johannes, oh, oh, see, her lips begin to move. She speaks. Maria, you gave me clarity, yes, clarity that shrouded me in darkness on all sides. I curse your clarity, and you I curse who made of me a tool of those wild arts through which you seek to misguide men. Not for one moment have I ever doubted how high you stand in spirit. Yet now one single instant has sufficed to tear all faith in you out of my heart, and I must recognize that they are hell-born beings, the spirits whom you serve. I had to mislead others because you misled me. I'll flee from you in regions wherein no word of yours can penetrate, and yet be near enough so that my Curses shall still reach, can still reach you. The fire of my blood you've torn away from me and given to your own false god. What must be mine? The fire of this blood, oh, may it burn you. I had to trust in lying and deceit and to accomplish this you had at first to make of me a phantom form. I've often had to see how deeds and thoughts of mine were changed into their opposite. So now let all that once was love for you be changed into wild hatred's fire. I'll hunt through all the worlds to find that fire that can consume you. I... Ah! Johannes, who is it that is speaking here? I do not see my friend. I see a gruesome being. Benedictus, Maria's soul is hovering in the heights. She's left behind her here, with us, her mortal semblance only. And where a human body is left without a spirit, there's room which then the enemy of good seeks out to step into the realm of visibility. He finds a body's covering, and through it he can speak. Just such an adversary spoke, who strives now to destroy the work I must fulfill for many human beings' future. For you as well, my son. For could I take these curses, just spoken by Maria's vacant shell, as other than the tempter's guile, you should not follow me. The enemy of good was at my side, and you, my son, have seen plunge down into the darkness the temporal part of her to whom your whole love radiates. Because so often spirits have spoken to you through her lips, world karma has not spared you from hearing through them also the prince of hell. Now you can seek her, finally, and learn to know her being's core, for she shall be the image of that higher man to whom you shall aspire to raise yourself. Her soul is so soaring forth to spirit heights, where men can find their being's primal form that in itself is rooted. You, know, you now shall follow her to spirit realms and see her in the temple of the sun. There forms itself within this circle a knot 
out of the threads which karma spins in world becoming. My son, you have stood firm so far. You will progress still further. I see your star in its full radiance. There is no place in sense existence for battles such as men must fight who strive for consecration. What sense existence hides as riddles which can be solved by intellect? What human hearts receive from such existence, no matter if it comes from love or hate or whether it bursts forth with frightful power, this, for the spirit seeker, must become a field on which he, uninvolved, directs his vision from without. For forces must unfold themselves for him which are not found upon this field itself. You had to wrest your way through trials of soul, which only come to those well armed to meet those powers belonging to the spirit worlds. And had those powers not found you ready to tread the path of knowledge, they would have had to lame your feeling before you were allowed to know what now has been revealed to you. The beings who can gaze at world foundations lead men who strive into the heights, at first up to that summit, where can be shown, if strength is theirs, for conscious spirit sight. Those who possess such forces can be released out of the world of sense. The others still must wait. You have sustained yourself, my son, when powers of the heights have shaken you and spirit forces shrouded you in dread. Your self has strongly battled its way through when doubts were wrestling in your breast and sought to give you over to dark depths. You have been my true pupil only since that portentous hour when you, despairing, felt that your self was lost, and yet the strength in you still held you firm. I was allowed to grant from wisdom's treasures what gave you strength to hold yourself, though you believed no longer in yourself. So was the wisdom which you conquered more truthful than the faith bestowed on you. You are now found mature. You now may be released. Your friend has led the way. In spirit you will find her. I can still further give you the direction. Call forth the fiery power of your soul with words which, uttered through my mouth, give you the key to spirit's heights. They will ac accompany you when nothing longer guides you which eyes of sense can still behold. With your whole heart now willingly receive them. Light's weaving essence radiates through far-flung spaces to fill the world with life. Love's blessing pours its warmth through time's long ages to call forth revelation of all worlds. And messengers of spirit join light's weaving essence with revelation of the soul, and when, with both, the human being can join his own true self, he is alive in spirit heights. O spirits who can be perceived by man, quicken with life the soul of this our son. Let shine in him what can illumine his soul with spirit light. Let sound in him what can awaken his self to joyous spirit growth. Spirit Voice, Behind the Scene Thoughts now guide him to depths of world beginnings. What as shadows he has thought, what as phantoms he has felt, soars out beyond the world of forms, world of whose fullness men when thinking dream in shadows, world from whose fullness men when seeing live within phantoms. Curtain, curtain, the end of scene three. This is a reading of The Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner, the synopsis of scene four. With full awakened consciousness, Johannes enters the imaginative world, on whose very threshold he encounters cosmic beings from above and below. And I could fill you with strength of selfhood, self-beings, joy. Araman, there was no time when you did not perceive me. Your body's eyes have looked on me through all of earth evolution. I could shine out for you with pride of beauty, with bliss of revelation. 
Johannes, to himself in meditation. This is the sign about which Benedictus spoke. Two powers stand before the world of soul. The one dwells in us as the tempter, the other dulls the gaze when it is turned toward outward things. The one assumed the woman's form who brought before my eyes the soul's delusion. The other can be found in everything. Exit Lucifer and Armand. The spirit of the elements appears with Capacius and Strader, whom he has brought out of the subterranean depths to the surface of the earth. It is to be imagined that as souls they look out over the earth's surface. Spirit of the Elements So here is now the place which you so ardently desired. It cost me care enough and trouble to satisfy your wish. The spirits and the elements arose in raging storm when I was forced to enter their kingdom with your beings. Your kind of thought resisted the ruling of my power. Capacius, grown young. Mysterious being, who are you who's brought me through the spheres of spirits into this pleasant realm? Spirit of the Elements, the human soul beholds me only when services I render him are over, yet he obeys my powers throughout all course of time. Capacius, I am but little moved to ask about the spirit who led me here. I feel the forces of my life grow warm in this new realm. This light expands my breast. I sense the whole world's might within the beating of my pulse. Anticipation of all I shall achieve is rising in my heart. I will transform to words this kingdom's revelation, invigorating me so gloriously and human souls shall blossom to life imbued with beauty when I can bring to them enthusiasm from the springs which here flow forth to me. Lightning and thunder from the heights and depths. Strader, grown old. Why are the depths so shaken? Why do the heights resound when dreams of hopeful beauty well forth from this young soul? Lightning and thunder. Spirit of the Elements To human dreamers as yourselves such words of hope ring proudly, but in the depths of worlds illusions of wrong thinking forever wake such echoes. You hear it only at those times which bring you near to me. You think that you are building at truth's exalted temples, but your work's consequences unfetter powers of storm within primeval depths. Thus spirits must break worlds apart. Should temporal deeds of yours not bring destruction, even death to the eternities? Strader For the eternities, then, error and illusion would be what seems the truth to man's best search for knowledge. Lightning and thunder. Spirit of the elements. Yes, error and illusion as long as man's mind searches in a realm estranged from spirit. Strader, you may well call my friend a dreamer who in the joy of youth paints his own goals courageously with so much noble fire. In my own heart, however, your words fade out and die in spite of storm and thunder which are their mighty helpers. I wrenched myself out of the cloister's peace to self-esteem of research. Throughout long years now I have stood amid the storms of life, and men believe what I entrust to them out of my deepest sense of truth. Lightning and thunder. Spirit of the Elements, then it behooves you to acknowledge that no man can know from whence are gushing the sources of this thought or where life's first foundations lie. Strader. Oh, these words, they are the same which in my youthful days of hope resounded terribly within my soul, when all support of human thought believed so firm began to sway. Lightning and thunder. Spirit of the elements, you must compel me with your stunted weapons of dull thought 
or you are nothing but a fleeting phantom of your own delusion. Strada. Once more such terrifying sounds, words, excuse me, once more such terrifying words, these two resounded out of my inmost core, when once a seeress made me feel the threatening sting of doubt, and so destroyed for me the circle of firm thought. But that is quite behind me. I will defy your power, you ancient one, who so deceivingly displays the image of my being within the mask of nature's ruler. Yet otherwise than you suppose shall reason overcome you. For if it has attained its proudest peak in man, it will then be the master and not the slave of nature. Lightning and thunder. Spirit of the elements. The world is ordered so that work performed demands return of service. I have bestowed on you your selfhood. You owe me my reward. Capacius, I will create out of my soul the spirit counterpart of things. When nature, to ideals transfigured, arises within human works, she is repaid enough in being truly mirrored. And if you feel yourself akin to the great mother of all worlds and have your origin in depths where primal powers rule, then let my will, that lives for lofty ends within my head and breast, reward you for your deed, for it has lifted me from clouded feeling to proud thought. Lightning and Thunder Spirit of the Elements You can behold how little your bold words are worth within my realm. For they unfetter storms and rouse the elements in wrath to rage against all order. Capacius, then you may seek reward wherever you can find it. On genuine spirit heights, man's impulses of soul must give themselves the measurement and order of their own. For he cannot create when others wish to utilize the work that he brings into being. The bird's song pouring from its throat is in itself enough. And so it is reward for man when he creating finds bliss in his activity. Lightning and thunder, spirit of the elements. It will not do that you refuse me payment. If you yourselves cannot accomplish it, then tell the woman who has endowed your souls with power that she must pay for you. The spirit of the elements disappears. Capacius, he's vanished. Now whither shall we turn? To find in these new worlds the right direction is first of all our task. Strata, to follow the best way that we can find with confidence and use our caution should lead us to our goal. Capacius, it seems to me we'd best be silent as to goal. We shall attain it if we obey courageously the impulse of our inner selves. To me this impulse says, Let truth become your guide, unfolding sturdy forces and shaping them to noble form in all you undertake. Then must your steps lead rightly to the goal. Strata. And yet from those first steps of ours awareness of the rightful goals should not be absent. If they are to be of benefit to men, and give them happiness. The man who serves none but himself need follow only his heart's urge, but he who wishes to help others must know for sure just what his life requires. The other Maria also in soul form becomes visible. But look, what a mysterious being! It is as if the rock itself had given birth to it, from out of from out what world foundations do such beings come? The other Maria. I rest my way through rocky depths and seek to clothe the rock's own will with human words. I sense the being of the earth and wish to thank the earth's own thoughts within the human head. I drink in air of purest life and bring the powers of air transformed to human feeling. Stoddard. You cannot help us, then. What must remain in nature's realm is far from human striving. 
Capetius. I love your language, woman, and gladly would translate your kindest speech into my own. The other Maria. So strange to me are your proud words. The way you speak I cannot understand. But if I let your words resound out of my being differently, they spread out over all the things that fill the spheres about me and answer then their riddles. Capacius, if what you say is true, then change for us our questions about right values in men's lives into your speech so that an answer comes to us from nature. We are incapable ourselves of asking the Great Mother in a way that she can hear our words. The other Maria. You see in me the humbler sister only of that high spirit being who dwells within the realm from which you have just come. She has assigned to me this sphere that I may show her mirrored image to human senses here. Capacius. Have we then fled from that domain in which our longing could be satisfied? The other Maria. If you do not discover the pathway back, it never will go well with you. Capacius. And which way is the right way then? The other Maria. There are two ways. When power in me reaches to its height, all beings of my realm begin to radiate in most majestic beauty and sparkling light then gleams from rock and water. On every side is glowing the richest wealth of color and gaiety of creatures floods the air with cheerful sounds. If you will give your souls to all the pure delights of my existence, you will soar forth on spirit wings toward primal origins of worlds. Strata, that is no way for us. In our speech it is called fantastic. We want to stay upon the ground, not fly into the cloudy heights. The other Maria. And if you wish to go the other way, you must renounce your haughty spirit. Forget what reason must dictate. Let nature's mood first conquer you. In manhood's breast let childhood's soul, untouched by shadow images of thought, hold sway naively true. Then will you come, though not through knowing, but surely to the springs of life. The other Maria disappears. Capacius. So, after all, we are thrown back upon ourselves, and we have merely learned our task would be to work and to await in patience the fruits that ripen from our deeds. Johannes, as if out of his meditation, here, as in the following scenes, he sits at one side and does not himself take part in the action. In realms of soul I find again the human beings who are known to me, the man who spoke about Felicia's fairy tales. I could behold him here as in his younger years, and also he who, as a youth, had chosen to become a monk, here as an old man he appeared to me, and with them was the spirit of the elements. Curtain End of scene four. This is a reading of the Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner. Scene five, the synopsis. Before the inner eye of Johannes, the hidden mystery place of the spirit leaders of humanity is revealed. In a subterranean rock temple, the four hierophants stand, representing the spirit forces of the east, south, west, and north. Felix Balda and the other Maria find their way into the temple because, quote, the time is now at hand, unquote, to open its treasures to mankind, that is, to lift the truth of the temple's existence into the day consciousness of modern man. The end of the synopsis. Scene 5. A subterranean rock temple, the hidden mystery place of the Hierophants, Benedictus in the east. As you have been my true companions in realms of everlasting life, so I have come to you today to ask the help I need to weave the threads of destiny for one who must receive from us the light. Through many trials and sorrows he has passed and has in bitter pain of soul prepared for consecration, which now shall bring him knowledge. My task is thus fulfilled as spirit messenger to bring the treasures of this temple to earthly human beings. It lies with you, my brothers, now to carry out my work. 
I have revealed to him the light which guided him to his first spirit vision. That the vision may turn to truth, your work must join with mine. My word springs forth from me alone. Through you the cosmic spirits sound. Theodosius in the South The power of love speaks thus, uniting worlds and filling beings with reality. Let warmth now flow into his heart, and he shall realize how he draws near the cosmic spirit by giving up the vain illusion of his self-bound life. You have at last set free his sight from sleep of sense. Now warmth shall stir and wake the spirit out of his inner being. You have drawn forth the self out of his body sheath. Now love shall make his soul grow firm, that it become a mirror, wherein must be perceived what happens in the spirit world. And love will give him power to feel himself as spirit, and so create for him the ear that hears the words of spirit beings. Romanus in the West My words are also not the revelation of my being. Through me the world will speaks. And as you have so strengthened the one entrusted to your care with power to live in spirit, so shall this power lead him through bounds of space and ends of time. Into those spheres he now shall pass where spirits act, creative. They will reveal themselves to him, demanding of him deeds, and he will do them willingly. The cosmic builder's goals shall quicken him with life. Divine primordial sources bespirit him. World-ruling powers grant strength to him. The mights of spheres illumine him, and lords of worlds befire him. Retardus in the North You have been forced since earth's beginning to suffer me within your midst. Today, too, in your counsel my word must have a hearing. Till you can carry out all you so finely spoken will take as yet some little time. So far the earth herself has given us no sign to indicate her longing for new initiates. As long as yet no mortals have come into this place who, uninitiate, can see the spirit free from sense-reality, so long am I permitted to curb your eagerness. They first must bring us tidings that new one revelation seems needful to the earth. Till then I hold your spirit light imprisoned here within this temple, that it may not bring harm instead of healing to human souls still unprepared. I give to man that part of my own being which makes the sense's truth appear to him the highest, as long as spirit wisdom can blind his inner eye. So faith may still continue to lead him toward the spirit, and all his goals of action can likewise still be guided by blind desires and passions that grope their way through darkness. Romanus we have been forced since earth's beginning to suffer you within our midst. But now the time has run its course, which was allotted to your work. In me the world will, feels, that human beings are approaching. Felix Balda appears in his earthly form, the other Maria in soul form, out of the rock. Romana still. In me the world will, feels, that human beings are approaching, who, uninitiate, can free the spirit from sense appearance. You are no longer granted the power to hinder us. Out of their own free will they now approach our temple to bring you word that joined with us they wish to help the working of the spirit. Till now they felt themselves not yet prepared for this, but clung to the belief that visionary power must stand apart from reason. They now have clearly seen where men are led today by reason, which, set apart from wakeful seeing, goes erring in the depths of worlds. And they will speak to you of fruits, which through your power must ripen in the souls of men. You too, who still unconsciously have forwarded my work, you shall still further help me. If you will keep aloof from what belongs alone within my realm, so shall the place reserved for you to work remain as you have had it in the past. Felix Balder 
power, speaking to my spirit out of the depths of earth, has bidden me come hither into the place of consecration, for it would tell through me of all its sorrow, all its needs. Benedictus My friend, so let us hear what you have learned within your inmost soul about the bitter sorrow in depths of earth. Felix Balder The light that shines in men and is the fruit of knowledge has to become the nourishment for powers who in earthly darkness do service to the cosmic course. But now for long they have been forced to lack such sustenance. For what evolves today within the brains of men can serve the surface of the earth but does not penetrate the depths. A fine new superstition like a spook haunts clever human heads. They turn their gaze toward world beginnings and like to fancy nothing but ghostly specters in the spheres of spirit. Thought out from sense illusion, the merchant would believe his customer had lost his mind who said to him, The mist that rises in the valley can be condensed to current coin, and with it you shall now be paid. No merchant would accept such money out of mist. Yet if he thirst to solve life's highest riddles, he willingly accepts whole cosmic structures made of nebula, if science hands them him to pay his spirit needs. A teacher who found out that untaught scoundrels wished without examinations to rise to heights of knowledge would threaten them with just disgrace. Yet science does not doubt at all that all untutored, void of spirit, the antediluvian animal could of itself become a man. Theodosius, Theodosius, why do you not reveal to men the sources of your light, which shines from out your soul with such resplendent ray? Felix Balta, I am called a recluse and a dreamer by those of kind intentions. The others think of me as just a blockhead who all untaught by them pursues his own poor nonsense. Retardus, you show us how untaught you are by speaking in such naive terms. You do not know that men of science possess sufficient shrewdness to argue about world beginnings as you have done. And if they do not do so, then know the reason why. Felix Balder I know quite well that they indeed are shrewd enough to understand such an objection, but certainly not shrewd enough as to believe in it. Theodosius what must be done to give forthwith the powers of earth what they so sorely need? Felix Balder As long on earth those men alone find hearing who are unwilling to recall their own true spirit source, so long the lords of metal ores will hunger in the depths of earth. The other Maria I gather, Brother Felix, from your words, that you believe the time has ended now in which we served existence on the earth, still uninitiate through wisdom's light, seeking to quicken spirit there and love out of our own life sources. In you the spirits of the earth have risen, creating light for you apart from science. In me has love held sway, the love which of itself develops in the life of man. In union with the brothers who perform the rites within the temple, let us further work to bring forth fruits in human souls. Benedictus If you unite with us, the work of consecration must succeed. The wisdom I have given to my son in him will blossom into power. Theodosius If you unite with us, the joy of sacrifice will grow, and love will then weave through with warmth the spirit-seeker's life of soul. Romanus. If you unite with us, the spirit fruits will ripen, and deeds will quicken, which, through spirit action, grow forth from soul discipleship. Retardus. If they unite with you, what will become of me? My deeds will then prove fruitless for pupils of the spirit path. Benedictus. You will transform yourself to other life, for you have done your work. Theodosius, you will live on in sacrifice 
if you will sacrifice yourself. Romanus, you will bear fruit in human deeds if I can cultivate the fruit. Johannes, as in the previous scene out of meditation, here stood before the eye of soul, the brothers in the temple, in figure they resemble men, well known to me in sense appearance. In spirit only Benedictus was the same. The one upon his left bears likeness to that man who only through his feelings wished to approach the spirit. The third resembles him who only recognizes powers of life in mechanisms and external work. The fourth one is unknown to me. The woman who upon her husband's death turned to the Spirit's light, I saw her in her deepest being, and Felix Baldi came just as he is in life. Curtain falls slowly. End of scene five. This is a reading of the first mystery drama by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Portal of Initiation. The synopsis of scene six. Felicia enters the elemental, elementary world at the request of the Spirit of the Elements, she tells a fairy tale for the first time in human evolution directly to the elemental beings, stimulating and provoking by it the quote-unquote Earth's brain in the character of German. The end of the synopsis. Scene 6. The same setting as in scene 4. The spirit of the elements is standing in the same place. Felicia Balda. Y- you've had me summoned. What do you wish from me? Spirit of the elements. Two men I've given to the earth. Through you the spirit power of both these men was quickened. They found within your words enlivening forces for their souls, when arid thought had lamed them. What you have given them has put you also in my debt. Their spirit is too weak to pay me for the service which I have rendered them. Felicia Balder For years one of the men had visited our cottage to gather there the strength that kindled fire in his words. Then later on he brought the other with him, and so the two devoured the fruits whose value then was still unknown to me. Yet little good did I receive from them as thanks. They gave to our good son their kind of knowledge. It was of course well meant, and yet through it our child was stricken with soul death. He'd grown and lived within the light which Father Felix gathers from what the spirits speak out of the springs, the rocks, and mountains. And joined with this was everything that's grown within my soul since my first childhood years. But in the dismal shadow of dark science, our son's true feelings for the spirit died. The happy child became a man with barren soul and empty heart, and yet You now demand that I should pay their debt to you? Spirit of the Elements It must be so. Since you have served the earthly part in them, the Spirit now demands through me that you complete the work. Felicia Balda It's not my custom to refuse what I should do. But tell me first of all if harm will come to me out of this deed of love. Spirit of the Elements when you first did for them on earth dis- excuse, maybe that again. what you first did for them on earth despoiled your child of his soul strength. What you now give their spirit is lost to you for your own self, and loss of vital powers will show itself in you as ugliness of body. Felicia Balda They rob my child of all the forces of his soul, and I should walk around a monster in the sight of men that for them fruits may ripen, which bring but little good? Spirit of the Elements, yet you will work for mankind's good and your own happiness as well. The mother's beauty and the child's life will blossom in a higher form for you when one day in the souls of men new spirit powers spring to life. Felicia Balda, what shall I do? Spirit of the Elements, you often have inspired human beings So now, inspire the spirits of the rocks. You must bring forth out of yourself one of your fairy tales, and at this time entrust it to those beings who serve me in my work. Felicia Balda So be it. Once upon a time there was a being that flew from east to west following the journey of the sun. 
It flew on over lands and over seas, and from the heights it watched the busy life of men. It saw how men love one another, and how in hate they persecute each other. Not anything could hinder this being in its flight, for hate and love create always the same a thousandfold. But over one house, on its way, the being had to pause. Within there was a tired man who pondered over human love and pondered, too, on human hate. His pondering had carved deep furrows on his brow, had turned his hair quite white. In its concern for him the being lost its guide, the sun, and stayed at this man's side. It was still in his room at evening when the sun went down, and when the sun returned, the being was once more caught upward by the spirit of the sun. Again it saw the many people in love, in hate, continue on their earthly course, and when it came a second time above the house, still following the sun, its gaze fell there upon a dead old man. German, from behind a cliff invisible. Once upon a time there was a man who tramped from east to west. The urge for knowledge lured him on to travel over lands and seas, and by his rules of wisdom he watched the busy life of men. He saw how men love one another, and how in hate they persecute each other. At every single instant he saw himself at all his wisdom's end, for how it is that hate and love forever rule the earthly world could not be brought into a law. He noted many thousand cases, yet lacked a comprehensive whole. This dry researcher encountered on his way a being of the light, upon whom life weighed heavily, for it was in a constant battle with a dark shadow form. Well, who are you? inquired the dry researcher. Oh, I am love, one being answered. In me behold dark hate, so spoke the other. The man, however, could no longer hear these beings' words. As deaf researcher, he tramped on from east to west, this man. Alicia Balda And who are you who thus distorts each word of mine in such uncalled-for manner? It sounds like mockery, and I am not the sort that likes to mock. German appears. I am the spirit of the earth brain. A dwarf-like copy of me is all that lives in men. Full many a thing is thought therein, which is but mockery of itself, when I reveal it in the size which it takes on within my brain. Felicia Balda. So, therefore you mock me as well. German. I must right often ply this kind of trade, but mostly no one hears me. I've seized this chance for once at least to be upon the spot where I am heard. Johannes, out of his meditation. This was the man who said that spirit light had entered as of its own accord into his brain, and like her husband Felix, Felicia came just as she is in life. Curtain, the end of scene six. This is a reading of the Portal of Initiation, first of the four mystery dramas of Rudolf Steiner. This is a synopsis of scene seven. The Spirit World. This scene in which Maria converses with the three soul forces has been treated in its cosmic aspect by Rudolf Steiner in his lectures on the secrets of the biblical story of creation, which followed the first performance of the Portal of Initiation in Munich, August 1910. He refers also to the part which Theodora plays in the spirit world when her seership reveals past events, an early incarnation of Maria as an apostle of Christianity of the Hibernian Mysteries. At the end of the scene, Benedictus speaks again mantric words, which in their essence lead to the Sun Temple, Scene 11. The end of the synopsis. Scene 7. The realm of spirit. Maria, Philia, Astrid, Luna, the child, Johannes, first at a distance, then coming nearer, Theodora, and lastly Benedictus. Maria. You, my sisters, at this hour be once again my helpers, as you have often been before that I may make world ether resound within, my, within itself. It shall ring out in harmony, and ringing permeate a soul with knowledge. I can behold the signs that lead us to our task. So shall your work unite itself with mine. Johannes, in his striving, shall, through creative deeds of ours, be raised to true existence. 
The brothers in the temple held counsel how they could lead him out of the depths to light-filled heights, and they expect of us that we arouse within his soul the strength for soaring flight. And so, my Philea, breathe in clear essence of the light from wide-flung spaces, be filled with tones enticing from soul's creative power, that you can hand to me the gifts you gather from spirit grounds. Then I can weave them into the stirring dances of the spheres. And you too, Astrid, beloved mirror image of my spirit, create the power of darkness in streaming light, that colors may shine forth, bring harmony to tonal being, so that world substance weaving can live and sound. I can entrust then spirit feeling to seeking human senses. And you, O oh sturdy Luna, you are as firm within as is the living heart that grows within the tree. Join with your sister's gifts the image of your own uniqueness, that certainty of knowledge be granted to the seeker. Philea, I will imbue myself with clearest essence of the light from worldwide spaces. I will breathe in sound substance, life bestowing from far ethereal regions, that you, beloved sister, with your work may reach your goal. Astrid, and I will weave into the radiant light the clouding darkness. I will condense the life of sound, that glistening it may ring, and ringing it may glisten, that you, beloved sister, may guide the rays of soul. Luna, I will in warm soul substance and will make firm life ether. They shall condense themselves, they shall perceive themselves, and in themselves residing guard the recreative forces, that you, beloved sister, within the seeking soul may quicken certainty of knowledge. Maria, from Philea's horizons shall stream forth joyfulness, the undine's power of ever-changefulness shall rouse a sensitivity of soul, that the awakened one can then experience the world's delight, the world's despair. From Ostrid's weaving shall spring forth love's desire, the airy life of sylphs shall stir up in the soul the urge for sacrifice, that he, the consecrated one, revive and quicken those who are sorrow-laden, those who are joy entreating. From Luna's strength shall stream forth firmness, the power of fire beings can actively create soul certainty, so that the knowing one can find himself in soul life weaving, in world life breathing. Philea, I will entreat the spirits of the worlds, that they with light of being enchant soul feeling that they with tone of words charm spirit hearing, that he whom we must waken may rise upon soul paths to heavenly heights. Astrid, I will guide streams of love that fill the world with warmth into the heart of him, the consecrated one, that he can bring the grace of heaven to earthly work and mood of consecration to sons of men. Luna, I will from primal powers beseech both strength and courage, and will embed them deep within the seeker's heart, that confidence in his own self may be with him throughout his life. He shall then feel himself secure within himself, and he shall pluck each moment's ripened fruit to, to draw from them their seeds for all eternity. Maria with you, my sisters, united for this earnest work, I shall succeed in what I long to do. There penetrates the cry of him who has been so sorely tested into our world of light. Johannes appears. Johannes. Maria, it is you. My suffering, then, has brought abundant fruit. It has now freed me from the phantom being that I had formed from out myself and that has held me prisoner. I could attain to you on paths of soul, and this I owe to pain. Maria, what was the way that brought you here? Johannes, I felt myself released from bonds of sense. My gaze was freed from all the limits imposed upon it by the moment. 
I could see other things within our human life than what a single instant can show within the narrowest circle. Capacious, whom my senses' sight has brought before me aged in years, the spirit showed to me as young, when, full of hopeful dreams, the youth set out upon life's journey that was to bring him constantly a faithful throng of hearers. And Strader, who is still quite young in earthly life and hardly has outgrown the cloister, I saw as he might be if he should follow out his aims as he's conceived them until now. And only those who are already filled with spirit as they are on earth appeared unchanged in spirit realms. Both Felix and Felicia had kept their earthly forms when I beheld them with my spirit eyes. And then the brothers in the temple showed me their favor in speaking of the gifts that will be mine if once I can attain to lofty heights of knowledge. And much more have I seen with my new spirit vision, which in their narrow way the senses first had shown me. The light of true discernment shone forth in my new world. But whether it was dream that dawned in me or spirit's true reality, I could not yet distinguish. And whether spirit's sight had come in touch with other things or whether I had merely widened myself into a world, I could not tell. Then you yourself appeared, not as you are at present, nor as the past has seen you. No, I beheld you as eternally you stand in spirit. Not earthly was your being. I clearly recognized the spirit in your soul. It did not act as does a human being within a sentient body. It acted as a spirit who gives existence to those deeds that have their roots within eternity. And only now that I can stand before you in the spirit does full light shine for me. In you my sense perception had grasped so firmly true reality that I am certain here in spirit land as well. It is no phantom form before me. It is the very truth of being in which I there encountered you in which I now may meet you here. Theodora, I am impelled to speak. Out of your brow, Maria, springs forth a shining light. The shine now shapes itself. It takes on human form. It is a man imbued with spirit, and other human beings gather round him. I look into long-vanished times. The holy man whose form ascended from your head lets stream from out his eyes the purest calm of soul, and tenderness gleams forth out of his noble features. Before him I perceive a woman who listens with devotion to the words which issue from his lips. I hear the words, and so they sound, You have looked up in reverence unto your gods. I love these gods as you love them yourselves. They have poured strength into your hearts. They planted courage in your hearts. Yet of these gifts they bring a higher spirit. Yet of these gifts they bring, a higher spirit is the source. I can behold how what he says awakens fury in these people. I hear their shouts, Oh, kill him, for he will rob us of the gifts the gods have brought us. But still the man speaks calmly on. He tells about the God descending to the earth as man, who thus has conquered death. He speaks of Christ. And as he goes on speaking, their souls grow gentler. One heathen heart alone resists and swears a vengeance on the man. I recognize this heart. It beats again within that child who nestles at your side. To him there speaks the messenger of Christ. Your destiny does not allow that you come near me in this life. Yet I shall wait in patience. Your path will lead you to me in the end. The woman standing there before him falls at his feet. She feels herself transformed. A soul is praying to the Son of Man. A heart is given in love to the messenger of God. Johannes falls to his knees before Maria. Maria, Johannes, what is dawning in you? You must awaken to full consciousness. Remembrance at this moment freed itself from fetters of the senses. You were aware of me and you have felt yourself as we were joined in earlier life on earth. The woman whom the seeress spoke about was you yourself. You lay thus at my feet when long ago as messenger of Christ I journeyed to your tribe. 
What in Hibernia's holy places was once disclosed to me about the God who dwelt within a human being and was the victor over powers of death, I was allowed to bring to peoples in whom were still alive those souls who offered mighty Odin their joyful sacrifice and had to think of Baldur, the radiant one, with sorrow. When first your earthly eyes beheld me in this present life, the power which grew within you was with the message that I brought. That power drew you to me. Because it worked so strongly, it was unconscious in us both. It had to weave into our lives the suffering that we struggled through. But in the suffering itself there lay the power to lead us into spirit realms, where we now truly know each other. Your pain increased to overflowing through presence of so many people. With them you are united through strength of destiny, and so the revelation of their beings could shake your heart so deeply. Karma has gathered them about you now to wake in you a power that helped your life progress. This power has so shaken you that you were liberated from the body and could ascend to spirit worlds. Since you stand closest to my soul and have kept faith to me through all your pain, it therefore is my lot to bring to its completion the consecration, blessing you with spirit light. The brothers who do service in the temple have wakened you to spirit sight. Yet you can only know this vision to be true if in the spirit lands you find again someone with whom in worlds of sense you are already bound in deepest being. In order that, that this one may meet you here, the brothers sent me on before you. It was the hardest of your trials when I was summoned here. I asked our leader, Benedictus, to solve for me the riddle of my life, which seemed to me so cruel. And blissfulness streamed forth out of his words when he revealed his mission and my own. He told me of the spirit to whose service the power within me should be dedicated. And at his words the purest spirit light, within an instant, had flooded all my soul, and had transformed all sorrow into blissful joy. At one thought only filled my soul. He gave me light, yes, light that granted me the power of sight. In this thought lived the will to give myself completely to the Spirit, and thus prepare the sacrificial deed that might then bring me near to Him. This thought had greatest power. It gave wings to my soul and carried me into this realm where you have found me. And at the moment when I felt myself set free from senses of the body, I could direct my spirit gaze toward you. I had before me not Johannes only. I saw the woman who had followed me in ancient times and who had joined her fate so closely then with mine. Thus spirit truth was given me through you, who in the sense world are already so closely linked with me in deepest being. I had attained to certainty of spirit, and was empowered to give it on to you. To Benedictus, sending forth a ray of highest love, I went before you, and he has given you the strength to follow me in spirit spheres. Benedictus appears. Benedictus, you here have found yourselves in regions of the spirit, and so I may once more be at your side. I could confer on you the force that urged you onward to these heights, yet I myself could not accompany you. Thus wills the law which I must follow. You had first through yourselves to gain the eye of spirit, which makes me visible here too for you. The path of spirit pilgrimage for you has just begun. You will face sense existence with fresh, strong forces, and with the spirit now unlocked to you, you can serve human progress. You have been joined by destiny together to unfold the powers which are to serve the good in active work. And while you journey on the path of soul, wisdom itself will teach you that highest goals can be achieved when souls will give each other spirit certainty, will join themselves in faithfulness for healing of the world. The Spirit's guidance has united you in knowledge, so now unite yourselves for spirit work. The rulers of this realm bestow on you through me these words of strength. Light's weaving essence radiates from man to man to fill the world with truth. Love's blessing gives it warmth. 
Love's blessing gives its warmth to souls through souls, to work and weave the bliss of all the worlds. And messengers of spirit join men's works of blessing with purposes of worlds. And when the man who finds himself in man can join one with the other, the light of spirit radiates through warmth of soul. Curtain, the end of scene seven. This is a reading of the first of the four mystery dramas by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Portal of Initiation. The synopsis of the interlude, which is between scenes seven and eight, Estella tells of a performance which has a similar plot to the mystery drama, with the fundamental difference that it ends where the latter begins. Sophia's words about the creative capacity of the artist and the need of our time to lift it into full consciousness form a prologue to scene eight. End of synopsis. Interlude. It is assumed that the preceding scenes were the performance which Sophia has attended and that she is visited again on the following day by her friend Estella. The following takes place in the same room as the prelude. Sophia. Do forgive me, Estella, for letting you wait. I was busy with the children. Estella. I had to come back. I'm so fond of you that I always long to share with you everything that stirs me deeply. Sophia. You will always find me with ready interest in everything that affects you. Estella. The play, The Uprooted, moved me so very much. It may seem odd to you, but there were moments when all the human suffering I have ever known or observed seemed to take shape before me. With great artistic power the play presents not only the outward misfortunes of people, but with astonishing insight a profound suffering of soul. Sophia. It is difficult to form an accurate idea of a play or of any work of art by simply hearing about it, but I'd be glad if you would tell me what it was that moved you so much. Estella. The dramatic construction was wonderful. The playwright shows how a young painter loses all his creative joy when he begins to grow uncertain in his love for a woman. She had given him the incentive to develop his talents. In her, through the purest enthusiasm for his art, a selfless love had sprung up, and thanks to this he was able to develop all his capacities. One might say he bloomed in the sunlight of his benefactor. As he was often in her company, his feelings of gratitude gradually grew into a passionate love. This caused him to neglect more and more a poor girl who had been faithfully devoted to him. His indifference made her realize she had lost the heart of the man she loved, and she finally died of grief. When he heard of her death, the news did not seriously disturb him, because by now his feelings belonged only to his benefactor. Yet he gradually had to come to the conclusion that her friendly feelings would never change into passionate love. This drove all creative joy out of his soul, and his inner life became ever more desolate. Now the young woman who he had forsaken began to haunt his memory, and what had once been a man of promise became a desolate ruin of one. Without a single ray of hope, he ended in utter despair. All this is enacted with the most vivid dramatic intensity. Sophia I can see how powerfully this play would affect you. I remember even when you were a child you used to suffer when you saw the fate of unhappy people driven by misfortune into bitterness and misery. Estella, you you misunderstand me, Sophia, dear. I can easily distinguish between a dramatic work of art and reality. We must not judge art by the same feelings as those aroused in us by similar events in real life. We must judge it for what it actually is. What stirred me so deeply was nothing but the perfection of the artistic handling of a serious problem. I recognized again, quite clearly, that art can only reach to such heights by being faithful to the whole of life. The moment it departs from this, it becomes untrue. Sophia, I understand you perfectly when you say that. I've always admired writers who could could represent what you call the faithfulness to life, and it seems to me that particularly nowadays many have achieved a mastery in this. But it is just these great artistic achievements that have aroused in me a certain uneasiness. For a long time I couldn't explain it. Then one day a light dawned on me that provided the answer. Estella, and now you are going to tell me that your worldview has led you away from your former appreciation of realistic art? Sophia, let's not talk about my worldview today. 
for you know quite well that I felt like this long before I had the slightest knowledge of what you call my world view. And I don't feel this only about so-called realistic art, but other schools, too, make a similar impression. This happens when I become aware of what I would call the untruthfulness in a deeper sense of various works of art. Estella, I really don't follow you there. Sophia, just consider, Estella, when you have perceived the complete reality of life, there comes into your heart a feeling of a certain poverty in works of art. For, of course, the greatest artist is only a bungler compared with the perfection of nature. The most finished artistic representation can never give me at least what I can get from the revelation of a landscape or a human face. Estella, but that is in the nature of things and can't be altered. Sophia, it could be altered if people would only be clear on one point. They should realize that it is senseless to imitate with human forces what higher powers have already spread out before us as consummate works of art. Yet it is those same powers that have implanted in man the urge to continue the work of creation. Man can actually give to the world what those powers have not yet set before the senses. It is where the powers of creation have left the world of matter unfinished that man can apply his creative striving. Why should he then imitate nature's perfection imperfectly when he can transform what is unfinished in her into completion? Imagine this idea changed into an elemental feeling, and you will understand why so much that you call art makes me feel uncomfortable. It is distressing to look at an imperfect representation of sense reality when even the most imperfect rendering of what lies hidden from external observation may prove to be a revelation. Estella, you are talking about something that nowhere exists. A genuine artist will never try to make a mere copy of nature. Sophia, that is just why so many works of art are unsatisfying. A creative person is led by the creative activity itself beyond nature, but he does not yet know the appearance of anything that lies beyond his sense perception. Estella, there is no possible way for us to understand each other on this point. It is very sad to me to see that in the most important human problems my dearest friend takes such a different path from my own. I hope our friendship will see better times. Sophia, in this we should be able to accept whatever life has in store for us. Estella, goodbye, Sophia, dear. Sophia, goodbye, my Estella. Curtain. End of prelude. This is a reading of the Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner, Scene 8, The Synopsis. Johannes Tomasius has painted a portrait of Professor Capacius. He has acquired the capacity of conscious penetration into the spirit background of the individuality. Therefore the shock which Strader receives when he realizes the cognitive forces active in art. The end of the synopsis. Scene 8. The same room as in Scene 1. Johannes, standing at an easel, near which Capacius and Maria are sitting, those seem to be the final strokes. I now can call the picture finished. To study in particular your being through my art has been a special joy indeed. Capacius, this picture truly is for me a wonder, and yet a greater one is its creator. The change which has occurred in you is unlike anything which men like me have until now held possible. Only One only can believe in such a change because the evidence compels it. I saw you first three years ago when I was privileged to come in contact with the group in which you've risen to such heights. You were a greatly troubled man just then. One saw with every glance into your face. I had just listened to a lecture in your circle and was then moved to utter words I wrung with difficulty from my soul. I spoke out of a mood in which one otherwise thinks of oneself alone. My gaze, however, rested constantly upon the sorrow-laden artist who sat there in the corner, mute, and yet his silent brooding was of a quite extraordinary nature. One could quite well believe he did not hear a single word of what was spoken round about him. It seemed as if the sorrow which consumed him possessed a life all of its own. It was as if the man was not the listener, but more as if his grief itself had hearing. Perhaps it would not have be too much to say that he was utterly obsessed by sorrow. Soon after this I met you once again, and you already seemed quite changed for happiness shone from your eyes, strength emanated from your being, and noble fire sounded from your words. 
At that time you expressed to me a wish which seemed, a most si- which seemed most singular to me. You wanted to become my pupil. And in reality these past three years you have immersed yourself with zeal in all I have to say on world events. And as we got to know each other well, I felt the riddle of your power as artist. Each of your pictures was for me a fresh surprise. During these words Strader has entered. In former days my thoughts had little inclination to rise to worlds beyond our human senses, not that I doubted them, but to approach them as a scholar then seemed presumptuous to me. And now I must acknowledge that you have changed my point of view. I've heard you say repeatedly you owe your powers in art entirely to that gift of consciously perceiving other worlds, that you can put into your paintings nothing but what you first beheld in spirit. I can see how in your work the spirit can actively reveal itself. Strader, I've never understood you less. In every artist, spirit surely has livingly expressed itself. What then distinguishes Tomasius from other masters? Capacius, I have not ever doubted that spirit shows itself at work in man, yet in most cases he is unconscious of its nature. He works out of this spirit, but he does not understand it. Tomasius creates, however, in the world of sense what he can consciously perceive in spirit, and he has many times confessed to me no other way of work is possible for him. Strader Tomasius is for me a marvel, and I confess quite frankly that in this picture here, Capacius, whom I thought I knew, is for the first time revealed to me. I thought I knew him well. The portrait shows me clearly how little I have really known of him. Maria Dear Strada, How can you admire so much the greatness of the work, and yet deny the wellspring of such greatness? Strader, what has the admiration I give the artist to do with my believing in his spirit sight? Maria, one can pay tribute to the work without believing in its source. Yet in this case there would be nothing to admire had not the artist trod the path that's led him to the spirit. Strader, We should not say that to immerse ourselves in spirit means to penetrate it with cognition. A spirit power creates within the artist as it creates within the tree or stone. The tree, however, cannot know itself. One who observes it can alone do this. The artist lives within his work and not in spiritual experience. But when I let my eyes rest on your picture, I can forget what is alluring to the thinker. My friend's soul power shines out of these eyes though they are merely painted. The scholar's thoughtfulness lives on this brow. The innate warmness of his words streams from each color tone with which your brush has solved this riddle. Oh, all these colors! They are only surface, and yet they're not. It is as if they're only visible to make themselves invisible to me. These forms emerging as the colors interplay speak of the spirit's weaving. Indeed, they speak of much which which they themselves are not. Where can it be? of what they speak. It cannot be upon the canvas, for there are only colors stripped of spirit. Then is it in Capacius? But why can I not see it in him? Tomasius, what you have painted itself destroys itself the moment that the eye would grasp it. I cannot understand where to this picture is driving me. What is it urging me to grasp? What is it urging me to grasp it? What should I look for? The canvas, I would like to break it through to find what I should look for. And where do I take hold of what this picture rays out into my soul? I have to have it. Oh, a man, oh, I am a man bereft of reason. It seems that ghosts are tricking me, a ghost that is invisible, and in my weakness I cannot yet discover it. Tomasus, you are painting ghosts. Into your pictures you have conjured them. They lure us on to seek them, but will not let themselves be found. Oh, cruel are your pictures! Capacius, my friend, in this brief moment you have completely lost the thinker's calm. Consider only, if a ghost should speak out of this picture, I must myself be ghostly. Strader, forgive me, friend, it was but weakness. Capacius, believe but good of such a moment. You had quite lost yourself, it seemed. The fact was, you were raised above yourself. What happened was for you as often it has been for me. However strongly we may feel ourselves equipped at such a time with all our thinking, we have but proven to ourselves that we are taken hold of by a power which cannot have its origin in reason or sense-knowledge. 
who has endowed this picture with such power? I'd like to call what I myself experienced through it a symbol. It teaches me to know my soul in ways that were not possible before. And this self-knowledge is convincing. Johannes Tomasius has probed my being because he has the power to penetrate through sense illusion to spirit self with his unusual spiritual vision. Now I perceive that ancient word of wisdom, Know thou thyself in a new light. To learn to know our being, we first must find that power in ourselves that as true spirit is able to conceal itself from us. Maria, to find ourselves, we must unfold that power first that penetrates into our inmost being. The word of wisdom says in truth, Evolve yourself in order to behold yourself. Strater, if one were to acknowledge that Tomasius, through the unfolding of his spirit, has for himself one knowledge of the being that dwells invisibly in you, one then would have to say that knowledge differs at each stage of life. Capacius, that is exactly what I would affirm. Strater, if this were so, then all our thinking is in vain, and knowledge is illusion. I would then have to lose myself at every instant. Let me be alone. Exit Strater. Capacius. I will go with him. Exit Capacius. Maria. Capacius is closer far to spirit knowledge than he himself is yet aware, and Strater suffers deeply. His spirit cannot find what ardently his soul is longing for. Johannes. The inner being of both men appeared before my spirit's eye when first I was allowed to step into the realm of soul. I saw Capacius as a young man, and Strader in those years which still lie far ahead of him. Capacius revealed a youthful promise, which hid much that his life in realms of sense will not let ripen. And it was this that drew me to his being. I could in his soul first behold, within the kernel of a human being, capacities of this life that declared themselves the sequel of a former life on earth. I saw the battles he had struggled through and which have built for him, out of another life, his present day existence. I could not yet bring to my inner eye his former life as well, yet nonetheless I could see much in his uniqueness that cannot be derived out of the present. Thus in his portrait I could bring to view what still holds sway within his depths of soul. My brush was guided by forces which Capacius unfolded from former lives on earth. And if I have thus unveiled for him his inmost self, my picture has then rendered the service which I had in mind. As work of art, I do not rate it highly. Maria, it will work further in that soul, for whom it pointed out the path into the spirit realm. The curtain falls while Maria and Johannes are still in the room. The end of scene 8. This is a reading of A Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner. This is a synopsis of scene 9. Johannes's soul is enhanced by the experience of new spiritual impulses in himself. He is able to identify himself with beings and events of his surrounding world, thus widening himself into his environment. The end of the synopsis. Scene 9. The same place as in scene 2. From rocks and springs resounds, O man, unfold your being. Johannes. O man, unfold your being. For three years now I've sought for power of soul with wings of courage to give these words their truth. Through them a man who frees himself can conquer and conquering himself can find his freedom. O man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resounds, O man, unfold your being. This power of soul is rising from within me but only gently touching spirit hearing. It harbors in itself the hope that growing it will lead the human spirit from narrowness far out to distant worlds, just as the tiny acorn mysteriously can expand into the giant body of the noble oak. The spirit in itself can bring to life what weaves in air and water, what has condensed to earth beneath, for man can grasp what has been taken hold of. For man can grasp what has been taken hold of life within the elements, in souls and spirits, in time and in eternity. The whole world being lives within my soul, when, in the spirit, there has taken root the power that gives these words their truth. O man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resounds, O man, unfold your being. I feel them sounding in my soul, rousing themselves 
to give me strength. There lives in me the light, there speaks around me brightness, there germinates in me the light of soul, there works in me world radiance, O man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resounds, O man, unfold your being. I find myself secure on every side, wherever these words, power, follows me. It will illuminate for, the, for me the senses' darkness, and will uphold me in the spirit heights. It will infill me with soul substance throughout all course of time. The essence of the world I feel in me, and I must find myself in every world. I see the being of my soul enlivened through power that is my own. I rest within myself. I gaze on rocks and springs. They speak the very language of my soul. I find myself again within that being to whom I brought such bitter grief, and out of her I call out to myself, Oh, you must find me once again and ease my suffering. The Spirit's light will give me strength to live the other self within myself. O oh, words of hope, you stream forth power to me from all the worlds. O oh, man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resound. O oh, man, unfold your being. You let me feel my weakness and place me close to lofty aims of God's. And blissfully I feel such lofty aims' creative might within my frail earth form. Out of myself shall be revealed the purpose for which the seed lies hidden in me, and to the world I'll give myself by living out my very being. I want to feel these words full power, although they sound so gently. They shall become for me a quickening fire in my soul forces and on my spirit paths. I feel now how my thinking penetrates deep hidden grounds of worlds and how its radiant light illumines me, illumines them. Such is the germinating power of these words, O man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resounds, O man, unfold your being. From light-filled heights a being shines on me, and wings I feel that lift me up to him. I too will free myself, as every being does, who overcomes himself. From rocks and springs resounds, O man, unfold your being. I see that being. I shall become like him in future times. The spirit will then free itself in me through you, exalted goal of man. I will now follow you. Maria enters. My eye of soul has been awakened by spirit beings who have welcomed me. And as I gaze into the worlds of spirit, I feel within myself that power. O oh man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resounds. O oh man, unfold your being. Maria, you are here. Maria, my soul has led me here. I could behold your star. It shines in its full power. Johannes, I can unfold that power from within me. Maria, so closely are we linked that your soul's life lets its light shine within my soul. Johannes, Maria, you are then aware of what has just revealed itself? For me, man's core of confidence, for me, the certainty of being, has been won. I feel indeed the power of the words which everywhere can guide me. O man, unfold your being. From rocks and springs resounds. O man, unfold your being. Curtain. End of scene nine. A reading of the Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner. This is a synopsis of scene ten. Johannes goes through intensive trials and illusions arising from his enthusiasm, which carries him into a luciferic sphere of self-enjoyment and self-reliance. The spirit presence of Benedictus awakens in him cognitive forces, revealing to him the seductive powers of Lucifer and Ahriman. Through this act of cognition, he is able to hear his voice of conscience, re-establishing his inner balance. The end of the synopsis. Scene 10. A Room for Meditation. Theodosius. Within yourself you can unfold all worlds. Bring me as cosmic might of love to life within you. A being who by me is inwardly made radiant feels his own strength of life enhanced when, happiness bestowing, he serves others. And so I weave the joy of growth into the universe. There is no realm of life without my power. There is no being who can live without me. Johannes before my soul's eye you appear, bringer of happiness to worlds. Creative joy impels my spirit when I see you as fruit of self-unfolding. You stood before my spirit gaze within the temple, 
though then I could not yet be sure if dream or truth appeared to me. But lifted is the veil that kept the light of spirit hid from me. I know now you are real. I will reveal your being in my deeds. Through you they shall work healing. And Benedictus I must thank. Through wisdom he has given me the strength to guide my spirit vision to the world. Theodosius Feel me in depths of soul and bring my strength to all the worlds. In deeds of love you shall partake of blessedness. Johannes I feel your presence give me warming light. I feel creative power arising in me. Theodosius disappears. He is gone. But he will come again and give me strength out of the springs of love. His light can vanish only for a time. Then it lives on within my being. I may rely now on myself, unfolding for myself the essence of love's spirit beings. Through him I feel myself uplifted. He shall reveal himself through me. He grows uncertain, which gradually comes to expression in his gestures. And yet how strange I feel. It seems a, a being is approaching me in spirit. Since I have been found worthy of spirit vision, I have this feeling always when evil forces would lay hold of me. And yet whatever comes, I have the strength to set myself against it. I can unfold myself within myself. These words give strength that is invincible. Most strongly now I feel the opposition. So it must be the fiercest adversary. Yet let him come. He'll find me armed. The enemy of good you must be he. Through your strong power you can be felt. I know it is your purpose to destroy whatever frees itself from your dominion. I will make strong in me that power in which you cannot have a single part. Benedictus appears. Oh, Benedictus, you, the source of my new life. It is not possible. No, it, it cannot be. It dare not be yourself. It must be a deception. Oh, come to life, good forces of my soul, and shatter the illusion desiring to ensnare me. Benedictus, ask of your soul if it can feel what through these years my presence meant to you. The fruit of wisdom grew through me, and only by its help can you progress and banish error in the spirit realm. Experience me within yourself, but if you would go further, you must set foot upon the path that leads you to my temple. My wisdom shall still shine on you, but must flow forth from out the place wherein I work, united with my brothers. I gave to you the strength of truth. If it enkindles its fiery might in you, then you will find the way. Exit Benedictus. Johannes. Oh, he has left me. But whether I have dispelled illusion or a reality has left me, how can I tell? And yet I feel myself grown stronger. It was not an illusion, but he himself. Oh, Benedictus, I experience you within me. You've given me the power which living on within will sever truth from error in myself. And yet I just succumbed to a strong illusion. I felt with horror your approach and could regard you as a deception, although you stood before me. Theodosius reappears. You will free yourself from all illusion if you will find yourself with forces that are mine. Though Benedictus could accompany you to me, your wisdom must now lead you on. If you experience only what he has placed in you, you cannot then unfold yourself. In freedom strive into the light-filled heights. Receive my strength now for this striving. Exit Theodosius. Johannes. Your words sound glorious. I must within myself bring them to life. From all illusion they will set me free when fully they pervade my being. So... Work on further in my soul's foundation, sublime, majestic words. You must have had your origin in the temple, since Benedictus' his brother uttered you. I feel you rising from my inmost being. These words will sound out of myself and so be comprehensible to me. You, spirit, living in myself, arise from your concealment and show yourself in your true being. I feel already your approach. You must appear to me. Lucifer and Araman appear. Lucifer, O man, know me. O man, sense yourself. You have wrenched yourself away from spirit guidance, and you have fled into free earthly realms. You have sought your own true being in earth confusion. 
to find yourself proved your reward. Use this reward. Affirm yourself in spirit daring. You will find alien being in the wide regions of the heights. It will confine you to human fate. It will oppress you. O man, sense yourself. O man, know me. Araman. O man, know yourself. O man, sense me. You have escaped from spirit darkness, and you have found the light of earth. So suck the power of truth from my solidity. I harden solid ground. You can, however, lose it. By facilitating, you disperse the power of being. And you can squander in lofty light the strength of spirits. You can disintegrate. O oh man, sense me. O oh man, know yourself. They disappear. Johannes, oh, what is this? From me came Lucifer, and following him, Araman? Do I live through still more illusion? By Benedictus, his brother, were those powers summoned, who in men's souls create illusion only. Voice of spirit from the heights. Thoughts now guide you to depths of world beginnings. What to soul illusion impelled you, what in error has sustained you, appears to you in spirit light, light of whose fullness men, when seeing in truth, are thinking, light from whose fullness men, when striving, in love are living. Curtain, end of scene 10. This is a reading of The Portal of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner, the synopsis of the last scene in the play, scene 11. Just in medieval times, the true mysteries led to the secret of resurrection. So here in the Sun Temple, the deepest secrets of spirit guidance become manifest. The individualities who have begun the path to higher knowledge find their places for the good of humanity within the Temple under the guidance of the spirit leaders in wisdom, love, and force of will. They form a spiritual community based on diversity by which the retarding tendencies are overcome. The end of the synopsis. Scene 11. The Sun Temple. The hidden mystery place of the Hierophants at the surface of the earth. Retardus. In front of him stand Capacius and Strata. You've brought me into sore distress. The tasks that I have given you, you have mismanaged badly. I summon you before my judgment seat. Capacius, I gave to you a lofty spirit nature, so that ideas of human aspiration became the pleasing content of your speech and should have had the power to convince. I guided your activity to circles wherein you met Johannes and Maria. You should have driven out their inclination towards spirit vision through the power your words might have upon them. Instead of this, you gave yourself entirely to the influence that came from them. I opened for you, Strader, the path to scientific certainty. Your strength of thought should have destroyed the magic power of spirit vision, but you lack certainty of feeling. The power of thinking slipped away from you just when the chance of victory was there. To both. My destiny is closely linked with what you do. Through you are lost forever for my kingdom, Maria and Johannes, both seekers after truth. Their souls I must hand over to the brothers. Cambasius. I never could convey your message rightly. You gave me power to present the life of men. I described what in one age or in another had inspired human beings, and yet I was not able to paint the past with words that had the strength to wholly fill the souls who heard them. Strader, the weakness into which I had to fall is but the image of your own. You could confer upon me knowledge, but not the power to silence all the longing which strives within man's heart for truth. I always had to feel quite other forces stir within me. Retardus, you see the outcome of your weakness. The brothers now are coming with those souls through whom they are to conquer me. Johannes and Maria obey the brothers' leadership. Enter Benedictus with Lucifer and Araman. Behind them Johannes and Maria with Philea, Astrid and Luna. Then Theodosius and Romanus with the other Maria, Felix and Felicia Balda. Finally Theodora. Benedictus to Lucifer. Johannes and Maria's souls have room no longer for blind forces. They are upraised to spirit being. Lucifer, 
I must indeed release their souls. The wisdom they have won gives them the power to perceive me. I only hold dominion over souls as long as they cannot behold me. And still my might remains allotted me in world becoming. And though I may not tempt their souls, yet in the spirit shall my power let ripen for them fruits of greatest beauty. Benedictus to Armand Johannes and Maria's souls have conquered error's darkness in themselves. Their eyes of spirit they have opened. Armand I must renounce their spirit. They turn now to the light, and yet it will not be denied me, still further to delight their souls with shine of semblance. They will not any longer believe it to be truth, but they will have the power to see how semblance manifests the truth. Theodosius to the other Maria Your destiny was closely linked unto your higher sister's life. I could bestow on her the light of love, but could not give the warmth of love as long as you continued to allow the best part in your nature to arise from darkness of your feeling only and did not strive to see it clearly with the full light of wisdom. The influence of the temple does not reach to motives rooted in blind instincts, however much of good they wish to do. The other Maria. I must admit that noble purposes work blessing only in the light and turn now to the temple. My feeling shall in future not rob the light of love of its effect. Theodosius, you grant me through your insight power to give Maria's soul light to the world. It always had to lose its strength on souls who bear your former nature and do not wish that love be joined with light. Johannes to the other Maria. I see in you the kind of soul that also in myself has governed me. I could not find the way to reach your higher sister as long as warmth of love remained aloof from light of love in me. The sacrifice you bring the temple shall here be reenacted in my soul. In me the warmth of love shall sacrifice itself unto the light of love. Maria Johannes, you have won in spirit realms knowledge now through me. To spirit knowledge you will add the soul's true being when you can find your inmost soul as you found mine. Philea, from out all world becoming shall the joy of soul reveal itself to you. Astrid, with all your being you will now be able to illuminate the warmth of soul. Luna, you may then dare to live yourself as self when light can shine within your soul. Romanus to Felix Balder You stood aloof a long time from the temple. You wished to recognize illumination only when your own soul itself revealed the light. Men of your nature robbed me of the power to give my light to earthly souls. They only wished to draw out of dark depths whatever they should give to life. Felix Balda, it was men's very folly that from dark depths has shown to me the light and led, let me find my way into the temple. Romanus, that you have found your way can render me the power to illuminate the will of both Johannes and Maria, that it shall not obey blind powers, but out of cosmic aims shall give itself direction. Maria, Johannes, you have now beheld yourself in spirit through myself. You will as spirit experience excuse me, you will as spirit experience your being when cosmic light beholds itself in you. Johannes to Felix Balda I see in you, my brother Felix, that impulse of the soul that in my spirit has held my will in bondage. You've willed to find the way into the temple. Within my spirit I shall lead the power of will the way into the temple of the soul. Retardus. Johannes' and Maria's souls now rest themselves out of my realm. How shall they hence how shall they find henceforth what springs from out my power? As long as in themselves the grounds of knowledge were still lacking, they were delighted with my gifts. I see myself compelled now to relinquish both of them. Relisha Balda that men can in can kindle in themselves the fire for thought without your help. I've shown you clearly. 
There streams from me a knowledge that's able to bear fruit. Johannes, this knowledge shall unite now with the light that from the temple's boundless source shines forth into the souls of men. Retardus, Capacius, my son, you are now lost. You have withdrawn yourself from me before the temple's light can shine for you. Benedictus, he has begun the path. He feels the light and he will win the power to fathom in his soul what until now Felicia has created for him. Strater, seems that I alone am lost. I cannot banish doubt itself and I shall never find again the path that leads me to the temple. Theodora, out of your heart soars up a glowing light. A human image shapes itself from it and words I hear this human image speaking, and so they sound. I have now conquered for myself the power to reach the light. My friend, trust in yourself, for you yourself will speak these words when once your time shall be fulfilled. The end of scene 11 and the end of the portal initiation by the most high.